City News. CIWW 1310 AM in Ottawa. And CJET 1011 FM in Smith Falls and the Valley. Number one for local news, traffic, and weather for Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News 1011 Everywhere. It is Thursday, March 2nd. Good morning. I am Damilola Unime. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, light snow, minus one. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. Breaking news reaching us uh, from uh, Ottawa Police. Uh, apologies have been a 35 year old for the Orleans explosion. Cody Troy Crosby is facing 12 charges, including arson and criminal negligence. The arson unit investigated the February 13th explosion that brought four homes under construction to the ground and damaged over 30 others in the area. His other charges include four counts of causing bodily harm, four counts of criminal negligence causing bodily harm, arson explosion causing property damage and arson with disregard to human life. With the weather forecast for Ottawa and the Valley, here is City News weather specialist Denise Andriachi. A bit unsettled at times throughout the early part of the afternoon. Highs near plus two today. We are clearing out overnight and we have quite a bit of sunshine through the day tomorrow before the snow starts to move in. So another high impact snowfall expected for Ottawa and Smiths Falls for Friday night, overnight and through early Saturday. We'll also see some blowing and drifting snow. Highs today near plus two. City News time is 10.02. A House of Commons is, uh, committee is continuing its investigation into foreign interference in our last two elections, with meetings getting underway right now. As City News Parliament here reporter Cormac Mac McSweeney tells us, our top spy and election officials will appear. There will definitely be more intrigue with the testimony today. First up will be Canada's chief electoral officer and the commissioner of Canada elections, who is in charge of investigating any possible breaches of the Elections Act. So opposition MPs may quiz her on what was done about the interference or why there have not been more investigations. The big witness, though, will be the head of CSIS after documents from the spy agency leaked to some media outlets detailing the tactics of the Chinese government in its attempts to interfere in our elections. Yesterday, the National Security Advisor to the Prime Minister, Jody Thomas, said of the documents that intelligence is not evidence and that the leaked fragments don't give the full context. However, she did acknowledge the meddling in our elections. This threat is on the rise and increasingly complex. The greatest foreign interference threat to Canada comes from the People's Republic of China, though other states like Russia and Iran are also attempting to convert covertly or coercively interfere. However, her and other officials say the last two votes were fair and legitimate. Opposition parties are calling for a public inquiry. Cormac McSweeney, Parliament Hill. City News time is 10.03. All the war police are still asking for your help locating a missing woman. Diane Pfeiffer is 35 years old. She was last seen on Saturday, February 25th in the Montreal Road area. She's an Inuit female, about 130 pounds. She has brown eyes and shoulder length dark hair with green streaks. A full description and photo is at our website, ottawa.citynews.ca. If you spot her or you know where she is, you're asked to contact Ottawa Police. I am Damilola Unime for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Connecting you and your community. This is the Sam LaPrade Show on City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Well, thank you so much for joining us here on City News. I'm Sam LaPrade. We have a very busy show for you today. We wanted to start our day off today with our mayor, Mark Sutcliffe. Hello, mayor. Good morning, Sam. How are you? I'm fantastic. How about yourself? I'm doing great. So how did you sleep last night after uh, passing that budget? Did you sleep like a baby? <laughs> uh, I sleep very well every night. I'm very lucky uh, that way. Um, so... No, it was a great day yesterday, and I'm very grateful for the collaboration of uh, my colleagues on City Council and the great work of city staff. and And um, it was it was really a good process yesterday, and and over the past month when we've been working on this budget together, and and uh, to have it pass with a unanimous vote is very gratifying. And now uh, you know we've got that done. We've we still have a lot of work ahead of us, but. Uh, but it was it was uh, it was some great work by the team yesterday. 
Mayor, let me ask you this. I mean, you obviously were were asking questions of of mayors for decades. What was the difference for you being in the mayor's seat going through this budget? Was there any surprises about the the process? Was there any surprises about where money is spent? Um, that's a great question, Sam. I guess uh, I would say um, there were no big surprises. Um, what I'm really encouraged by is the fact that we have a really strong council. There are some, some you know, the, the, the group of people around the council table is really terrific. They genuinely care about the people of Ottawa. And, and I think there's a real spirit of collaboration. Um, and, and, and people were feeling very good after the budget passed. Um, we have an amazing team at the city of Ottawa and the, and, you know, there are, there are so many people who come to work every day wanting to serve the residents of Ottawa and make life better for everyone in our community, including the most vulnerable. We're always challenged in terms of how we do that and, and where the resources are going to come from to do that. Um, and that's a, that's a constant constant challenge when you're budgeting um but i think i think we are taking a very uh fiscally responsible approach and a compassionate approach as well and so we passed a very uh a, a budget that takes a very balanced approach and and uh i think is in line with what what people wanted when you know when i when i was listening to people throughout the community during the election campaign last year i think this budget reflects what they wanted and I know that, you know, other partners, including the federal government, the provincial government, it really takes those two partners to make the budget for the city work in many ways. Talk to me a little bit about conversations you've had on, on different projects, whether it be the LRT or other infrastructure projects. Yeah, it really does come down to that, Sam. Uh, you know, it's a, the, the municipal level of government in Ontario is kind of an interesting dynamic. We, you know, we we... We don't get to make all the decisions that we would like to make. Um, a lot of decisions are imposed upon us. We we don't have the same levers in terms of generating revenue. We just, for the most part, generate revenue through property taxes, um, and and it's a, you know, it's not a perfect system. Um, other levels of government have all kinds of sources of revenue, other forms, you know, uh, retail taxes, uh, pro- uh, income taxes. Um, all kinds of other ways of generating revenue. We just have basically one. And and so we do rely on the other levels of government to support us in the work that we're doing. And so we're in constant conversations with uh, the federal government and the provincial government. And I'm, I'm grateful to have a strong working relationship with both governments, the the, the, uh, the, the Trudeau government in Ottawa and the Ford government at Queen's Park. And we're constantly talking about how we can leverage more dollars for affordable housing how we can um how we can invest more in supporting the most vulnerable in finding solutions for for mental health um issues in our community um so that work continues constantly um and um and i i hope we'll see some progress on that in the weeks and months ahead and let me ask you this and, and I swear this is positive. Uh, so in the last number of weeks here on City News, we, we have a, a great show between 12 and 1230 uh, where we invite community people in to talk about, you know, the news of the day. And one of the sort of themes that we've heard over the last number of weeks is that, you know, you've, you've made City Hall boring again, which is a good thing because it's not scandalous. There's no big, you know, challenges happening within the city and that it's not something that it's, it's, there's no drama there anymore. Do you feel that it's, that you're kind of leading this, this boring time or do you feel you're just getting the job done? Well, I think, you know, I would, I haven't heard those specific comments, but I, you know, I would take that to as, I would take that as a positive sign because I know that people felt, and I heard this throughout the election campaign, that the last couple of years at city council were dysfunctional. And look, I think there were a lot of reasons for that. There were people who had been around city hall for a long time. There were people who were deeply frustrated with the, uh, the convoy and the and and COVID, 
and the meetings were happening, you know, virtually instead of in person. And we all know that that, you know, it's not the same meeting online as as meeting in person. You don't have the same opportunity to kind of, you know, chat in between items. And, and you know, so there's there were a lot of dynamics that created to a very tense environment over the last couple of years. And I certainly wanted to change that. And I know many of my colleagues on council wanted a, a something different going forward as well. So, you know, we've worked very closely together over the last three months and, and I've been working hard to build relationships with everyone on city council. Um, not just, you know, not just the people who would necessarily naturally agree with me about everything, but everybody throughout city council. And, and I, I think, you know, what you saw yesterday was, was a sign of that. We didn't agree on absolutely everything, but the, 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 the temperature around, you know, the, the tone around the council table yesterday was very collaborative, very positive. That's the way it's been during this whole budget process. Um, it was respectful. Uh, there was, there was no tension in the air and, um, and, and, you know, we, we passed the budget unanimously. So I think that's a function of everybody really wanting to turn the page and, and start fresh with this term of council and, and making the effort to find solutions together and, and to be respectful in how we approach our work. And I think that, that, you know, that sentiment from, from residents or community leaders that it's, you know, that it's boring or it's calm, that is a good thing for residents. I think, I think we've had enough of the, of the drama, to be honest with you, Mark. I think a steady hand, um, you know, at, at City Hall is, is what we're looking for. It was a little bit spicy yesterday uh, because we had members of the community uh, disrupting the budget meeting. What does that sort of do to the flow of a meeting? Do you take, you know, sort of what, what people are saying? Are you, are you hearing what they're saying? Or are you start trying to get on with the news of the day? So what happened yesterday is is unfortunate, and and I respect the fact that there are people in our community who don't agree with every decision we make, and that's always going to be the case. Um, and and we've heard from the individuals who disrupted the meeting yesterday. We've heard from them at the police services board on a regular basis with their views about what we should do with the police budget. And we've listened to those concerns. We've also listened to what the you know everyone else in the community has had to say about emergency services in our community. Um, and and so you know we we passed a police budget that was not what they wanted. And so they came to the meeting yesterday and and disrupted the meeting. We took a break. We waited for the for the interruption to be over, and then we carried on with our business. Um, so it it resulted in a delay, but it it. It, it didn't, you know, really affect the meeting in any other way. And I think it's important to remember that, that you know, again, I respect the fact that, that not everybody agrees with, with, uh, with the decisions we've taken, and that's always going to be the case. But I'll, I'll remind everyone that, you know, I was very clear in the election campaign last year, as were many other people who ran for council in, in the 24 wards across the city, uh, there, you know, there we were asked about where we stood on investing in emergency services. We were asked about whether we wanted to defund the police or cut their budget. I explicitly said I wanted to increase funding for emergency services, and I wanted the police to hire 25 more employees. There were other people who didn't want to do that, who didn't agree with that, um, but but the people spoke with their votes in the last election, and they elected me, and they elected a council, and and that was a democratic process, and we the budget that we brought forward yesterday was voted on democratically at council and and that's the way the system works and so again i respect that not everybody agrees with it but um but but the people who disrupted the meeting um were were not representing what the majority of the people of ottawa you know with the, the opinions that they expressed in the last election Thank you for that, Mark. And we know that uh, Ottawa Police uh, have issued a news release uh, just about an hour ago indicating the Ottawa Police Arson Unit has arrested and charged a man yesterday afternoon in connection with the explosion that really rocked Orleans on February yeah. the 13th. Uh, we know that Cody Troy Crosby of 35 years old of Ottawa has been charged with a number of, of uh, offenses. How do you feel about this, uh, Mark, that, uh, you know, that this has been uh, the, the outcome here? 
Well, that's a matter for the police. Um, I um, I haven't seen that release. I I knew that it was coming, um, but I did. I don't I don't know uh, the the details of the release and and what's what's been reported to the public. Um, obviously, it's very concerning. It's you know, frankly, uh, a miracle that that nobody was killed in that in that explosion. It could have been much much worse. Um, and but it's still an incredibly disruptive event for so many families in that area. My colleague Catherine Kitts has been doing a, a great job in her ward, uh, helping those people. Um, and so we'll see how this how this plays out. It's it's um, uh, it's very disappointing and and disturbing that that it appears this was the result of a criminal act. Um, uh, we'll see how the how the process plays out, but. Um, um, but, you know, I, I, I hope this doesn't happen again. Absolutely. Uh, Mayor, thank you so much. You've been very generous with your time today. Of course. And, uh, and keep it calm there at City Hall for us, okay? <laughs> we'll do our best. Thank it's you a team so much. effort. There you go. Thanks, uh, Sam. Mayor Mark Sutcliffe joining us today, talking a little bit about the budget, also speaking with the mayor about the charges that have been laid in the Orleans explosion investigation. Very disheartening for, for so many families in Orleans. And I, I think about the first responders. I think about uh, Councillor Catherine Kitts, uh, Mayor Mark just uh, Mayor Mark Sutcliffe just uh, spoke about uh, about her involvement. She was right on the scene uh, within about an hour of it happening, and I just cannot imagine how families are feeling today that this was uh, and the, the charges have been laid. Uh, this, of course, has not been proven in a court of law yet, uh, but we have received that uh, information from OPS today. Stay with us here on City News. Sam LaPrade will be right back on City News. One hundred one one. Every year, dozens of Canadians are killed or seriously injured because they take risks around railway tracks. Talk to your loved ones about rail safety. Visit StopTrackTragedies.ca. Join me for Season 3 of Paula Roy's Favourite Foods. Whew, that was a lot. I think I need a nap. Chase Nicholas. I am a Mi'kmaq hockey player. Growing up, I always remember my family talking about the Mi'kmaq as the creators of the game of hockey. In grade 7, I did research on Mi'kmaq hockey sticks as the first sticks of the NHL. I found a Mi'kmaq hockey stick made in 1917, the same year the NHL was formed. I was surprised to find out the very stick I was holding was made by my great-great-grandfather, Alexander Cope. In 1934, an elder known as Old Joe Cope wrote a letter to the Halifax Herald claiming the Mi'kmaq created hockey. I found out later that I am a direct descendant of Old Joe Cope. There was a time when Mi'kmaq children were torn from their families and not allowed to speak their language, losing their words and stories. But the stories are coming back to us. Stepping on the ice, I take pride knowing the roots of the game of hockey stem from my ancestors in the Mi'kmaq nation. It's a new season of the new Fly Fisher on Rogers TV. Hi there, this is Meg from Fit Over 50. In our next workout, we're going to be using weights for a full body workout. You can expect both beginner and advanced options. See you then. The 
Sam LaPrade Show continues on City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Okay, well, we know it's kind of snowy out there and we're expecting, of course, some more winter weather, but many people have their eyes on the springtime. And I know Ian Fraser, race director for the Ottawa Race Weekend, is thinking ahead to the big weekend. Hi, Ian. How are you? Hey, Sam. Great to hear from you. Always a pleasure to spend time with you. So, Ian, let me ask you this. This race weekend is so much more then the race. The race, of course, is all very important, but but walk us through what goes into planning this incredible weekend. Yeah, so our, our planning uh, for Tamarack Ottawa Race Weekend 2023 um, started about 12 hours after um, last year's event. <laughs> so we start right away with... Um, you know, some pretty mundane stuff like making sure we've got all of our medals designed. I'm joking. That's a super important part. Making right. sure things like our medals are designed, all of our merchandise and all of those pieces are in place. But more importantly, we jump right in with uh, getting our Desjardins Charity Challenge up and running. Um, you know, over the past couple of years, uh, we've raised over $2 million, helped local charities raise over $2 million. Um, uh, I think at a time when um, the community really needed those funds most and so that's a huge part of what we do uh, in September and October we open registration uh, mid-September every year and so uh, you know a lot of our um, our marketing operations start at that point in time and then slowly towards the uh, you know the middle part of December we start digging into all of the operational pieces um, having you know multiple meetings and contracts with our city partners and the NCC on getting our routes established it's just you know, it's a 365-day-a-year project. Mm-hmm. And I don't think, yeah, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to touch on that. I don't think people really comprehend what goes in uh, to race weekend. Give me a sense, Ian, how many uh, runners you're hoping to have participate on May 27, 28th? Yeah, so so we are, are tracking to be above where we were in 2019, which was our last um, pre-pandemic in-person event. And we've been absolutely um, thrilled at uh, how registration has been going so far. Uh, we put uh, uh, about 30,000 participants in in 2019, and we're tracking just a little bit above that this year. And in an industry that's had some difficulty recovering post-pandemic, um, these numbers to us are, are absolutely um, just heartwarming. And, you know, we are the largest running event in Canada. Um, depending on how you measure it, we're probably the sixth largest running event in North America. So it's a big operation. And, and most of the larger events um, throughout North America have had a difficult time recovering. So I think, you know, our community supports this so incredibly well uh, our city partners are so supportive and i think it's a testament to the spirit um uh, of the city of ottawa to all the residents and to our years and years of historical participants that really support the event for sure quite incredible absolutely we just got off the phone with uh, mayor mark sutcliffe we were talking about the budget and and all sorts of sort of city issues i know this event is really important to mark as as a runner as well but as a mayor he's probably thinking about the economic boom talk to me a little bit about what this means for our economy here in this region (laughs) Yeah, it, it's it's um, one of the largest tourism drivers uh, in the city. So we um, we stimulate about thirty million dollars worth of economic activity for the city every year. Um, we fill um, countless hotel rooms. Uh, a number of local businesses really rely on on those participants coming into town. Um, those who are staying downtown in hotels, in particular. Um, there's also a whole subculture of, of contractors that work for us. So there's a, a real micro economy that exists around the event. Um, and I think um, we looked last year at our first year back since the pandemic as this great celebration of being able to be downtown, to be free, to be outside. And this year is really a continuation of that. Um, I think Ottawa needs uh, a continually uh, ongoing spiritual lift and and we think that we provide that and you know we encourage everybody sam not just runners not just hardcore performance-based runners but we love uh, families uh, we love walkers uh, we look at our event as really a celebration of what ottawa at its very best has to offer 
and I can absolutely tell you from firsthand experience that you accept everybody because I have participated, Ian. Um, <laughs> and, and I was lapped by a 90-year-old. But anyway, we won't talk about that. Uh, but the event really is, it was something I did with my daughter, and we knew we weren't going to break any records that day, Ian. But it was about being there. It was about being with uh, with the community. It was about experience. It was about raising money. It was about, about all of it. So if people are thinking, hey, May 27, 28 looks pretty good. I want to participate. How is registration going? Are you still uh, looking for people to register? We are, and and the events um, in the in the weekend schedule that we w- would love to see more people register for are the two K and the five K. Our two K is an amazing opportunity for families to come out and participate. It's a distance that um, we think you know most families can come in and share. Uh, it's incredibly exciting. It takes place you know just before our five and ten K. There's great energy downtown at City Hall and in Mar- Marion Dewar Plaza. So we we encourage people to come out to the two and the five for sure. We think that's a, just a great community builder. And of course, uh, on Saturday we have the 10K as well. Um, Sunday we have our half marathon and marathon. Um, so it's a real celebration. So there are lots of opportunities left to register at runottawa.ca. Um, so come out and join us. Be part of your community. Celebrate your community. And Ian, if you're looking for a, a pace bunny at about 60 minutes for 2K, you know where to come, right? It's this I'm, girl. I'm yeah. going to send you an email right now. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I always uh, look forward to, to spending time with you, Ian, and, and I know how much time and effort goes into this event. So, uh, so send all those positive vibes to your team as well, okay? Thanks so much, Sam. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. Ian Fraser, Race Director for Ottawa Race Weekend. If you're not signed up, you better get there. Be part of the the big weekend. When we come back, the Ottawa Mission CEO, Peter Tilly, is going to join us. We're going to be talking about the budget that was put aside to help the vulnerable people in this community. I'm sure Peter has lots to say. Come on back on City News. Sam LeBrad will be right back on City News. 1011 FM. October 5th, 2014, my daughter was hit by a train. She was walking along the sides of the tracks and it shattered her world. (laughs) It's closing time and you stayed out longer than you planned. So now you can't drive and the buses have stopped running. You could always call your girlfriend or maybe your roommate. What about your best friend? You could just dial one triple eight taxi guy or use the taxi guy app. The call and the app are free and they both connect you to a local cab company to bring you home safely. Visit arrivealive.org to find out more. Arrive alive, drive sober. At Celebrate Ottawa, we love showing you something a little different. We showcase remarkable people highlighting the city's diversity in arts, culture, sports, and nature. We will show you features that prove Ottawa is a vibrant and exciting city. We'll entertain you and we'll even teach you new things. Join me, your host, Lila Grine, as we explore and celebrate Ottawa. Hi, everybody. My name is Brian Aslan, and I'm with The Commotions. We are performing Encore Ottawa 3 this week. Be sure to tune in. Hi, I'm Justice. And I'm Nia. And we believe dreams fuel revolutions. revolutions. That's why we're engaging with Canadian icons and the causes they support. Join us for these inspiring conversations and find out how you can be revolutionary. Traffic and weather for Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News 1011 Everywhere. It is Thursday, March 2nd. Good morning. I am 
Damilola Unime. Right now in Ottawa, minus one in Smith Falls, it is zero. And here's what's making news this hour. Charges have been laid in relation to the Orleans explosion. 35-year-old Cody Troy Crosby is facing 12 charges, including arson and criminal negligence. They have four counts of causing bodily harm, four counts of criminal negligence causing bodily harm, two counts of break and enter, and arson explosion causing property damage and arson with disregard to human life. The Ottawa Family Health team is set for an expansion of primary care services in the Valley. The announcement is scheduled for later today regarding the uh, boot, uh, to boost rather, to primary uh, medical care in Carlton Place. There will also be an update on the specialized disease management in the communities of Carlton Place and Beckwith. The announcement is scheduled for 4 p.m. on Costello Drive. And a House Affairs Committee will hear more testimony today as his status allegations of foreign interference in elections. Canadian Security Intelligence Service Director uh, is set to appear for the first time, along with representatives from the RCMP and Elections Canada. National Security Advisor Judith uh, Thomas testified yesterday. New Democrat MP Peter Julian is calling for a public inquiry into foreign interference in the 2019 and 2021 federal elections. I am Damilola Unime for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. The Sam LaPrat Show continues on City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Well, the vast majority of us have a safe place to sleep. You know, we've got everything we need at home we've got a shower we've got probably a fridge full of food everything we need to survive but so many and more than ever many many members of our community are living on the street or in precarious situations in terms of their housing they're in shelters it's very hard when you get into the shelter system to get out of the shelter system it seems very counterintuitive, but that is just the way it is. We wanted to have a conversation today with Peter Tilly, CEO of the Ottawa Mission. Hi, Peter. Hi, Peter. Yes, hi. Are you there? Pardon me? I Sorry, we're just having a hard time hearing you. You're good to go? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, fantastic. So, okay, sorry. So, Peter, when we think about housing and we think about the budget that was passed yesterday by Ottawa City Hall... Was it enough, Peter? Well, it's never enough when you look at that, uh, the number of units that were short here in the city of Ottawa that, um, you know, for every one unit that's uh, built of affordable housing, we're losing seven or year over year. That average rents went up 14% just last year alone. Uh, we're looking at uh, 2000 dollars for a one bedroom apartment and uh, right now Ottawa community housing reporting that there's 12,000 people on their wait list so it's going to take a big effort and we think that's other levels of government uh, coming to the table to initiate that development and growth but in the meantime here in Ottawa we had uh, the mayor was clear on his election campaign that uh, no more than a 2.5 percent property tax increase he stuck with that he got the budget through with that and yet even doing that with all the competing priorities the mayor and city council uh, decided to increase the $15 million envelope to $16.5 million to throw in another $1.5 million designated towards affordable housing. So certainly a step in the right direction. Uh, some of us were asking for $5 million more, but uh, it is at least a, a step in the right direction um, and something that will be put to good use. And we know that there's a development that was planned for Orleans. Uh, there's still some public consultation going on uh, regarding that. Uh, the residents worry there isn't enough parking uh, to sort of accommodate that uh, that housing, which would have been, I believe, about a one third or twenty five percent of affordable housing, is it disappointing when those kinds of initiatives, Peter, don't sort of move smoothly? Yeah, very disappointing. You start to look at the moving pieces um, that are involved there, whether it's parking. Um, some are saying that uh, some of the neighbors are, are pushing back because of the worries about affordable housing. I mean, these people will be good, uh, good inhabitants, good ten tenants, good residents. They'll build that community. Um, we need to be building affordable housing 
right across this city. Everybody knows that. Uh, uh, an annals poll before the election showed that 83% of people thought that affordable housing should be a top priority for anyone coming into city council uh, for the mayor. And, and it's an issue that's top front and center on the minds of many people here in Ottawa. So we really uh, hate to see a development opportunity like this stalled, one where what we're always asking for is inclusionary zoning or that there'll be a significant portion of a new build attributed uh, put aside for affordable housing. Let's hope it moves forward. And we do see that, Peter, to, to your point about the number of people that say, yes, this is a priority, but, but just not near me. Not right? in my I mean, backyard. Yeah, so, I mean, that's, you know, and I'm not saying that about myself. I'm saying that, you know, generally, um, that, you know, people don't want that type of thing in their community. Um, and, and I always find that uh, that's so interesting and it's uh, it's so challenging to, to see that. And, and, and worries about parking, not that they're not legitimate worries, uh, but but I think the, the first lens have to be solutions as opposed to we're not going to build anything. That's right. And, and uh, uh, was there enough consultation? Um, I don't know that piece. I know we have a couple of mixed market apartment buildings, one in the West End, one in the East End, uh, that the mission has um, purchased and developed, uh, you know, into uh, affordable housing units, mixed market. It's a very successful model, uh, but certainly for at our end, there was a, a significant consultation with the public to allay any fears, to to uh, put them at rest that uh, these will be good tenants, and they have been good tenants. Uh, we're good neighbors, and um, I'm sure uh, this opportunity in Orleans is a chance for people to show they can, they'll be good neighbors and uh, we've, we've got to help people who are struggling uh, whether somebody out of university can't afford two thousand dollars or maybe somebody coming through our programs uh, who have turned their lives around as you said we don't want this to be a permanent stop it's it's a chance to move on into a better life but that can't happen with roadblocks uh, like we're seeing um, when it comes to trying to find uh, affordable housing. Because I think the key, Peter, is to keep people out of this shelter system as opposed to in this shelter system and then having to get them out. Um, I think that was one of my biggest surprises when I worked um, at the Ottawa Mission, as you know, for, for about a decade, is that it was really hard for people to, to then, you know, find something and not be part of the system. And as you know, Sam, uh, especially the, this last decade, we've really invested in, uh, through our strategic plans, the mental health supports, moving the addiction program off-site. It was just here at the shelter, uh, the relapse rates, the uh, triggers, the um, you know the challenges we were dealing with, and now the success rates that were off-site, leading to people going through the Chef Rick's job training program, leading to people going through other job training opportunities to turn their lights around. Well, let's let's give them that independent living that everyone aspires to when when they've turned their lights around and gone through the shelter system, not roadblock. And the most you may find is a is a rooming house. Um, if that, uh, just uh, it's ten percent of the people here at the mission are people with jobs, and and they just can't find a place to live. They're they're in minimum wage jobs, and and they're maybe not getting full time hours. They they just can't afford to live elsewhere. They shouldn't be here in shelters. That was always a very big surprise to me, where I would see somebody heading off for their day uh, of work and and returning to the shelter. I. I I was I was shocked by that, Peter. To be honest with you. Yeah, and it's not our role. We're an emergency stopover for somebody who's um, hit the hit the rock bottom. Somebody who was the last house on the block. Everything else is turned against them. They've been asked to leave, you know, their place. Us talking to a gentleman Saturday. Uh, we were in here for an event, and um, a gentleman from Barhaven whose uh, family had asked him it's time to leave. He had unfortunately, uh, over the course of the past year, developed a severe cocaine addiction, spending uh, thousands a month on cocaine. And, um, you know, as uh, he told me his journey, his story, and how he was hoping to be here for a month or two to um, to get his life back in order so he could return to his family. And an hour later, I walked by and he's on the phone to his wife and he ended the call with, OK, I love you. And that uh, we're here to support that. But um, again, if he didn't connect back with his family, we'd want him to have a place to go to live, not end up here at the shelter. For sure.
And, and, you know, those stories break my heart because I think it's really easy to drive by, whether it be the Mission or the Sheps or, or anywhere downtown and see somebody on the street that, that clearly isn't, isn't housed and isn't healthy and, and to throw judgment. Really, really easy to do that. I remember one of my, one of the most emotional times for me at the Mission was somebody that just wanted someone to say his name to him. Mm. You know, it, it was somebody that uh, I had gotten to know a number of the gentlemen that worked there, and, and I didn't know his first name, so I would just say hi to him, but I was calling other people by their first names, and he came up to me one day and he goes, can you just, my name's Robert, can you just say, hey, Robert, when you pass by? Mm. And I thought, wow, there that summarizes the mission. That summarizes the work of, of, of vulnerable people because so often people that enter into that system just become a number, right? We talk about 400 people or 500 people or, or whatever in terms of, of the numbers of people on the street, but we don't talk about, about their names and about the fact that they may be saying to someone that day, I love you and I'm trying to get back mm. to you. Yeah, and it's, uh, you're so right, Sam. That's such a key piece call all your customers by name you know knows all his customers by name as a song used to say and 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 for me it's it's a critical piece as well too that i'll often have a conversation and sneak over to the front front line and say what's that gentleman's name now come write it down so i can call them by name the next time we have a conversation it's dignity it really is dignity you count you're not a number here under our roof we're, we're we're trying to work with you, Jim, Robert, whoever, and uh, we're, we're, we are we care for you. You're so right. It's such little things like that. Mm-hmm. And then on to the other pieces as well, too, that we uh, put people together. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a nice initiative to see uh, in the budget that it was a priority for city council, that in uh, so many competing pressures, that even a small increase is, is, uh, sends a, uh, a sign Uh, to the community that this is an important area, but there's a lot of work to do. Peter, we spoke recently with uh, a gentleman who was doing a lot of converting of office buildings into into affordable housing. And it was really fascinating because he has come up with, and I wish I could remember his name, but he has come up with this incredible sort of checklist of what makes an office building good to be transformed, um, mm. you know, quickly into affordable housing. And it was, it was fascinating. He's doing it all over the world. And I believe he's actually from Ottawa. And what he was talking about was you know some of the you know the the, obviously the office buildings that are no longer being used by the government or by corporations and maybe transitioning those because in often you know often there there was there was actual offices and there was enough bathrooms and and all of those types of things to to kind of uh, make this work so that creative lens uh, you know, I'm hoping that this new mayor and council, um, and whether it be the Ford government, the Trudeau government, I'm hoping there's that creativity that's bubbling in the background that we can be creative and, and maybe even be a case study someday for here's how Ottawa did it and got it right. Yeah, that'd be um, all of that, that, um, you know, repurposing buildings so that they can convert to affordable housing, making sure we hang on to the current housing stock that's out there um creative partnerships as you're saying sam we were approached by the city a few years ago there was a a vacant house uh in in the somerset ward Uh, so again not in the downtown core a vacant house in the somerset ward that had been an eight bedroom rooming house had become dilapidated in terrible condition and run down and it was going to go on the market and the city was concerned it would become a single unit uh you know that somebody would go in and renovate and turn into a nice home it's a nice location and they approached us to partner with them because they knew we had the capacity to move quickly and we did we worked with the city um they they funded a significant portion they they led us to ontario renovates to renovate the units we had to throw uh you know our share of cash in as well but that place nine months later was rebuilt restructured uh, is safe met uh, to all zoning codes and now we have seven out of eight of those units occupied um, with people with the other to move in uh, you know at the end of this month 
uh, just some final preparation work to do. So there's eight people housed, each with, um, we made a point of uh, really renovating the building so that they could each have a small contained bathroom and a small kitchenette because we know a lot of the problems with rooming houses is when there has to be um, people sharing uh, resources, uh, it can lead to conflict. So that was one of our goals is to do it the mission way and, and set up a, set people up for success. And it's going very well so far. But again, that creativity, creativity like you're talking about, um, uh, but we do need the federal government right. to continue on with the national housing strategy. Um, when you're talking the big builds, some of these cities like the size of Ottawa needing uh, at least a thousand units to be built and soon um, that is where the federal government is going to have to come forward we feel uh, as they committed in their national housing strategy. Well I love that we've left on a positive note uh, Peter uh, Tilly thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thank you very much for having me on, Sam. Peter is the CEO of the Ottawa Mission. When we come back, we're going to talk about some initiatives for youth in our city. Lock it in to City News. Sam LaPrade will be right back on City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. cooking by Umchef. With the cost of food constantly on the rise, we can't afford to let good food go to waste. I'll show you how to whip up a tasty and healthy meal with on sale and discounted items, which will save you a few bucks as well. It was John's graduation. We were so proud. We all got together for a picnic. That's when we heard coming from the radio. So we stopped and we listened. It helped us get to safety. That's why when I think of I think of John, because now he has a real future to look forward to. On Thursday's Daytime Ottawa, the Vanier Museo Park will be joining us on the show because their Sugar Festival is back. You may recall that their Sugar Shack burnt down. Well, it has been rebuilt and they are so excited to have it back. Also, Little Ray's Wildlife Rescue has a couple of traveling exhibits they're really excited about. So I'm guessing we'll probably get some pretty cool creatures in the daytime studio. All that and more on Thursday's Daytime. Hey everybody, my name is Car, and I'm here with my best friends Shane and Monique. Join us on Rogers TV for Fitness Faction. Every week we're going to take you through a full body workout. We've got strength training, we've got cardio, we've got HIIT. Ladies, let's get back into it. I think we've got 10 more skaters, let's go. City News forecast for today could be a windfall of cash. With our weather guarantee, if we're off by three degrees, you could win. Enter at ottawa.citynews.ca. And if you hear your name on Wake Up with Rob Snow at 721 a.m., call in to claim your cash. Play four games of bingo from the comfort of your own home each Monday at 7 p.m. for your chance to win money from our $2,000 regular bingo or $5,000 super bingo night. Kiwanis TV Bingo, Mondays at 7 p.m. on Rogers TV. Eleven o'clock news today. We're going to spend some time with John Fraser, interim party leader of the Ontario Liberal Party, and of course MPP for Ottawa South. 
we have lots to talk to John about. A uh, very, very big list of, of items happening at Queen's Park. We want to get his take on, uh, so you'll want to stay for that for sure. We wanted to uh, get caught up today with Jesse Card, Executive Director for Youth Ottawa. Hi, Jesse. Hi, Sam. How are you? Fantastic. It's so wonderful uh, to see you in this role, Jesse. I know how hard you've worked uh, in this sector, and you're getting ready for the Spirit of the Capital Youth Awards. Uh, what stage are you at right now? So uh, thank you for everything you do, Sam, and having us on. You've, uh, you've always been a great supporter of, of our organization. We, we really appreciate that. I'll, I'll start with that. But uh, it's an exciting time. We've just opened the nominations for the Ca- uh, Spirit of the Capital Youth Awards again. Um, so we're really encouraging the community to identify and nominate um, any youth that have uh, really stood out and, and kind of... Um, worked hard and 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 are uh, kind of a remarkable youth that deserve to be recognized right now it's it's wonderful so how would we how would we go about nominating someone yeah so so on the youth ottawa website youthottawa.ca um there's kind of a new uh, big post that we've put out uh um where you can click on that it talks about the, the award it's our 26th year um uh, running these these awards and really there's um, there's seven categories that you can nominate a youth under um, arts and culture, service and caring, taking a stand, entrepreneurship and innovation, academic perseverance, strength through diversity, and uh, a final Max Keeping uh, Personal Courage Award um, to kind of honor, uh, honor Max's uh, contribution to the organization. Uh, so you can go on there. It, it has all the information plus the, uh, the place that you can actually submit the application in both French and English. In English. And if there's one thing I know about these awards is usually there's not a dry eye in the place. It's very emotional. Uh, the youth uh, really get into it. It's something that there's an incredible alumni built over over all those decades in terms of, of the people that have gone through and and uh, been part of the, the spirit of the Capital Youth Awards. Give us a sense of, of when the big night is. Yeah, so we're actually pushing the, the event up uh, uh, to the end of June, and that's kind of... What we used to do pre-pandemic, uh, we used to have it uh, kind of in the in the late spring uh, to kind of coincide with high school graduation and, and all the celebrations happening at the end of June. Uh, the pandemic pushed us to kind of move it to the fall, but we're bringing it back. Uh, it's closer to uh, Youth Week, which is running in May. Uh, so, you know, that's going to be a good promotional push during Youth Week to, uh, uh, to promote the events. But it's going to be happening on June 29th this year. Um, every uh, every award winner, there's 14 youth that are going to be recognized. They all get a thousand dollar bursary towards uh, their their post secondary education. Uh, great networking opportunity, like you mentioned, all of the alumni over the over the two decades, um, and uh, they're usually very engaged. And lots of opportunities actually to work with CTV Ottawa this year. So so a lot of great uh, opportunities for these youth. Well, that's wonderful, Jesse. Thank you so much for spending time with us, and uh, we look forward to uh, to seeing who uh, who becomes uh, one of the the award winners this year. Lots of great categories there, uh, Jesse. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sam. Appreciate it. Jesse Cart joining us, Executive Director of Youth Ottawa. If you know an outstanding youth, this might be the opportunity to recognize them, which is fantastic. Um, We've got lots for you today. John Fraser, as I mentioned, is going to be coming up, interim party leader of the Ontario Liberal Party. We have so much to talk to John about. We're also going to be spending some time today with Eric Elper. He's a publicist and music commentator at That Eric Elper on Twitter. Uh, He's got uh, a great topic for us today. We're looking forward to that. And Keith Whittier is joining us a day early today. Uh, So he's going to talk about all the movies that you need to see. He's our movie reviewer, and we really rely on him to tell us what to see and, most importantly, what to avoid. Uh, Are you uh, watching any great movies these days, Noah? You know what? I've actually not had the time recently for anything great. Although Keith put me onto something recently on one of his Facebook reviews I saw actually for Cocaine Bear. I know we kind of talked right. about it. Uh, I think last week with Derek actually, yes. and it's something that looks so silly and outrageous that I kind of I feel like I just have to watch a bear do a bunch of cocaine in the woods. So. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, so as you know, I was off last week. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately. So I the vid. yeah the vid I know, uh, but I started watching some TV, which I don't get a chance to watch a lot of TV. Right. So. One thing that had been recommended to me was the show on Netflix called The Watcher. 
Oh yeah, the, uh, the a little creepy for you, but oh my especially goodness, especially when you're staying home at, at no, home alone. I know what to, what was I thinking? <laughs> but what surprised me is this was based on a true story. So this is where a story or a sorry a house in in New Jersey, a couple moves into it, all these bizarre things happen to them. And it still remains unsolved after all these years. You know what's funny? I actually didn't know it was based off a true mm-hmm. crime story. I knew that the the people who were making it were involved in some other true crime shows that they had made, but I didn't actually know The Watcher itself was based off that. Interesting. And the casting is so incredibly perfect for this. It's it's Naomi it's Watts, right? Naomi oh, Watts. I love Naomi. But Watts. Jennifer Coolidge plays the real estate agent. Okay. And she is brilliant. Well, she had a killer year with White Lotus and and The Watcher. Yeah. And I haven't seen White Lotus yet, so I'm looking forward to that. I've been watching, uh, of course, I was on a lot of social media, you know, hanging out or whatever. I saw the one and only Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters. What a legend, yeah. Okay, so he's he's obviously a rock star. Oh, yeah, one of the biggest, yeah. Yeah, he's awesome. And he'll be in Ottawa this summer. I can't wait. I know. I'm so excited. But he was doing something pretty fantastic. I didn't know he was such a great cook, but he cooked Me for either. over 450 people at an L.A. shelter, pulled up with all the equipment, got out there. I think he made ribs. Oh, I mean, yeah, it was ribs, like brisket. it was amazing. You know what's what crazy cool about dude. it, too? Uh, so uh, I think a lot of people just assume he was kind of there for one evening, but he was there for almost 48 hours. He was there. He prepped. He got there at 6 p.m., prepped all the brisket, brought in all the smokers, family and friends to help. He stayed there overnight. While he was smoking from 11 p.m. Yeah. till the morning, where then he served. He got maybe a couple hours of sleep, he said, during a nap. And wow. people said he was a, a pleasure to interact with, giving out hugs and love and just trying to make everyone happy. Sounds like a great guy. I have heard so many great things about him. Me too. I, I don't think I've ever heard a bad thing about Dave Grohl. Yeah, actually. and I just, I love I love those kinds of initiatives. And, and from what we hear, too, he wasn't doing it for... Wasn't doing it for you and I to talk about no, it today on no, the radio. Exactly. He was kind of trying to do it and kind of And those are quietly. more examples we need from people in those 100%, positions, right? A hundred percent. Uh, Noah, thank you so much for everything Always. you do for our show and Aaron as well, working hard today. Uh, we wanted to, uh, once again, spend time with John Fraser, interim party leader of the Ontario Liberal Party. We know they have a big weekend coming up. We're going to talk to John about elections. We're going to be talking about the allegations of some interference. Uh, we're going to be speaking with him a little bit later about that uh, right after the 11 o'clock news actually and we're also getting ready for our lunch today we're going to be talking to a couple of our community members we're going to talk about everything you can possibly imagine under the sun we're going to feast on those big news stories of the day and we hope that you're with us here on city news sam lapratt will be right back on city news 1011 fm and Twenty bucks. Twenty bucks. We're on the line for twenty bucks. Hello, I'm Jim Deeks, host of Canada Files. I hope you'll join me each week for interesting and informative discussions with some of Canada's most impressive people. After a night out with your friends, there's always options for getting home safely. You could call your BFF, your mom or dad, whoever you can count on for a safe ride home. You could call your favorite cab company or one taxi guy Or you could use the Arrival Live smartphone app to help you choose your ride. Be it a friend, transit or taxi, getting home safely is app easy. Now available for iOS and Android devices. Visit ArrivalLive.org to find out more. Arrive Alive. Drive sober. Hi, I'm Meg from AIM Fitness, and I'm here with my buddy, Fit Finley. Join us every week for Fit Over 50. We'll take you through some low-impact and high-intensity workouts designed to improve your strength and your balance. All you'll need is a resistance band, some light hand weights, and also your water bottle and a sturdy chair. Tune in right here on Rogers TV, and let us be part of your weekly routine. Hi, my name is Ange. I'm from the Angelina Hunter Trio. We will be performing this week as part of Encore Ottawa 3, and we really hope that you enjoy our set. Every year, dozens of Canadians are killed or seriously injured because they take risks around railway tracks. Talk to your loved ones about rail safety. Visit stoptracktragedies.ca.
News. CIWW 1310 AM in Ottawa. And CJET 1011 FM in Smith Falls and the Valley. Number one for local news, traffic, and weather for Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News 1011 Everywhere. It is Thursday, March 2nd. Good morning. I am Damilola Unime. Right now in Ottawa, minus one with light snow. In Smith Falls, it is zero. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. A 35-year-old man is facing charges, including arson and criminal negligence in the Orleans explosion. The arson unit investigated the February 13th explosion that leveled four homes under construction and damaged another 30 in the vicinity. Cody Troy Crosby of Ottawa is facing 12 charges altogether, among them four counts of arson causing bodily harm, four for criminal negligence causing bodily harm, arson explosion causing property damage, and arson with disregard for human life. With the weather forecast for Ottawa and the Valley, here is City News weather specialist Denise Andreacci. A bit unsettled at times for the early part of the day today, but we'll ease through later this afternoon and clear out this evening and overnight down to lows near minus 10. Soak up that sunshine through the day tomorrow. Highs near zero. Snow begins Friday night. Five plus centimeters through Friday night and then an additional 10 overnight into early Saturday where we have highs near minus one, but blowing and drifting snow will be a concern early Saturday. The daytime high today, two degrees. City News time is 11.02. The Upper Ottawa Valley Detachment of the OPP has laid charges against a 51-year-old driver following a traffic complaint at about 10.30 p.m. yesterday. Officers in Pembroke received a traffic complaint when they located the vehicle. They spoke with the driver and conducted a roadside screening as part of their investigation. Jay Jids of Laurentian Valley Township has uh, been charged with failure or refusal to comply with demand. His driver's license has been suspended for 90 days and his vehicle was stolen and impounded for seven days and he's due in court on the 25th of April. Meanwhile we are learning uh, electoral officials are now investigating claims of foreign interference in the last vote as the House of Commons committee continues its investigation into meddling by the Chinese government in our last two elections. City News Parliament here reporter Cormac McSweeney has more. While testifying at a federal committee, Caroline Simard, the Commissioner of Canada's election, says since November she has received complaints and seen the news reports about foreign interference in our votes and she takes them very seriously. So as a result, she has launched a review. That this review is ongoing as I speak to determine whether there's any tangible evidence of wrongdoing under the Canada Elections Act. However, as a result of that review, she's not able to answer many questions given confidentiality of her investigations. Meanwhile, Canada's chief electoral officer says our spy agency sees this never shared with him any specific allegations of foreign interference. Leaked documents from CSIS were the basis of reports that detailed China's efforts to try and sway the votes in 2019 and 2021. The head of CSIS is testifying later today. Meanwhile, opposition parties are also debating over a motion that would call for for a national inquiry into foreign interference. Cormac McSweeney, Parliament Hill. I am Damilola Unime. For news anytime, follow up online at onoa.citynews.ca. The Sam LaPrat Show continues on City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Thank you so much for spending time with us here on City News. I'm Sam LaPrat. I wanted to head to Queen's Park and speak with John Fraser, interim party leader of the Ontario Liberal Party, and of course the representative of MPP Ottawa South. How are you, John? Great, uh, Sam. How are you? Good. I was looking at all the things we could talk about today, and I think it would take us about four and a half hours to get yes. through everything. Uh, going on, yeah. Lots going on for sure. Uh, this weekend's really important for your party, uh, John. How are you feeling about uh, uh, Ontario Liberals getting together this weekend and and really trying to find your new leader? Well, it's actually that's the beginning of that process. So you know, we've got we're going to have like our biggest biggest AGM and almost 20 years, uh, 1,500 delegates. We're going to decide how we're going to vote for the next leader, either delegated convention or one member, one vote. Uh, that'll be an interesting debate. Uh, we're going to elect a whole new party executive. So it's going to be a really busy weekend. And 
we're looking forward to it. Um, as I said, you know, it's just it's it's the beginning of that process uh, that we're going to have for our leadership race, and you know, we'll um, at, you know in the months after we elect a new executive, decide how that's going to that leadership race will shape up. Um, the pro, you know, the process of electing a leader is as important as when the leader gets elected because it it helps you. Uh, do things like work in regions where you need to work, get more members, uh, have healthy debates about the things that are most important to Ontarians. It's it's such an interesting time for your for your party. I mean, you had uh, forty people get together and say that you know try to convince uh, Mike mm-hmm. Schreiner of the Green Party uh, to come over and and put his hat in the ring to to lead the Liberals. You've got Yasser Natfi, MP interested. You've got Bonnie Crombie, of course, Mississauga Mayor interested. We're hearing uh, potentially Stephen Blay from the Ottawa area. Area. Lots of people thinking about putting their hat in the ring. Is it disappointing, John, that that you're not going for that role? Oh no! I, I mean, I think uh, I, um, you know, my job here uh, was to help get us ready again for another leadership, uh, and um, at the same time do the work that we need to do here at Queens Park, which is ask the government the tough questions. So um, I, I just I, myself personally, I'm uh, I'm not disappointed. I'm excited about the opportunity to design a race with uh, executive council that'll uh, help you know strengthen and build our party and then when the new leader is elected that new leader will have a party that's stronger uh and ready to win you know an election in 20 uh 2026 so yeah you know well we'll have at least you know we're gonna have at least six candidates you know uh, um it'll be a healthy race um which is good and it's important you know it's you know the ndp they didn't have a race they had only one person run to be leader of the opposition right um and so you know i which i find uh, it's hard to understand you know i think Mara's going to be a good leader of the opposition and i wish her well uh, but i find it hard to believe that there was only one person in a party that wanted to be the leader of the official opposition here in ontario and if it, i don't know if it was in ours last time we had that same question we had there was like uh, 10 or 12 people that entered into the race so uh, the race is important uh, as much as the outcome. Uh, that uh, that certainly was very interesting to follow for the NDP, and I, I agree with you. I was I was disappointed there wasn't a race because that's what that's what a democracy is, right? So mm-hmm. I, I was disappointed that. Speaking about democracies, we know that mm-hmm. we're seeing some some interference uh, potentially in terms of the election um, from China. Here's what Pierre uh, so Pierre. Here's what Prime Minister Trudeau had to say about that. There are multiple processes ongoing. There are uh, report, a report that just came out, an independent report that just came out on the functioning of the high panel uh, for election interference. But we will continue to do what is necessary to reach those two clear goals that Canadians can expect. First of all, that our agencies and officials and institutions have all the tools necessary to safeguard our democracy and our elections. And two, that Canadians can continue to have confidence, not just in our national security officials, but in the integrity of our democracies. We will continue uh, to work to make sure that that happens. John, this is uh, this is a topic I think Canadians are really paying attention to. What do you think about what uh, what the Prime Minister said today? Well, no, he's right. There are processes that are going on right now that are looking at this, and I think one of the things that people are, are calling for is they you know they want something that's more public, and I you know I think um, I understand that people want transparency, they want information, and so I you know I think that the government has to address that, has to make sure that people feel that. Um, they're getting the information that they need. Having said that, at the same time, you know, in these situations where you're involving security agencies, uh, there are uh, sometimes when you don't actually want to go into a, a line of question because you're currently investigating something or there's a process underway uh, that you don't want to jeopardize, much like in the courts uh, and uh, and police investigations. So, you know, in the states they have, uh, an ability to uh, they have like a bipartisan committee uh, that um, that studies this um, and it's done in camera so that you know uh, there's you know so that if there is information uh, about stuff that's ongoing uh, that uh, you don't want to let the people who it's ongoing uh, about know about it uh, then that information can be come to the people who are responsible for making decisions so mm-hmm. it's kind of it's 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 sometimes a difficult 
uh, needle to thread. Uh, the Americans, you know, I think they do a good job of that because of the way they've set up uh, some of their committee structures and, and the bipartisan nature of these security committees that are, um, in, a sense, in a sense, secret, uh, because they need to be to protect national security. It's certainly an issue that we're following very closely here at City News and uh, and wanting to uh, ensure that we, yeah. you know, bring everything we can in, in terms of this issue. Because I think Canadians, I think this has been a wake-up for Canadians, to be honest with you, uh, John, in terms of, of the election process. Let's uh, let's head back to Queen's Park and talk a little bit about the Ford government in terms of, of the Greenbelt development, uh, that infamous stag and doe, uh, and, and everything that's happening there. Where, give us a bit of an update, uh, John, in terms of of uh, how you're pressing the Ford government in terms of that development? Well, there, currently there are, are two, uh, the uh, integrity commissioners launched two inquiries uh, into um, into the government, um, and um, or at least one. One is pending uh, on the uh, the fundraiser that was held at the uh, Premier's house to, house to benefit a family member. So, you know, I, I you know, there's, a lot of information around this, and I just believe, you know, we stick to the facts. And the Premier, by his own admission, you know, has said that, you know, there he has close personal friends, and we know that those close personal friends have people who are benefited, who benefited from greatly from the cracking open the green bill. Hosts of fundraisers are at his home to benefit a family member, developers, their lobbyists, people who do business with the government, they're invited to buy tickets, make donations. And um, and so that's not that's a conflict, that's not right, you know. It's in that you that 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 um, those relationships would be used to raise money. Uh, and I think you know that's what I am pressing him on. You know, all the details around who it was for and whether it was a wedding and a stag and go stag and doe. I mean, I, that's information. But the thing is is that people who were um, uh, doing business with the government, people who benefited greatly from the Greenbelt decision and their lobbyists were invited to donate money to someone in the Premier's family. That's not right. But it, and I just think sticking to the facts, you know, uh, is the most important thing for us to do here. But isn't it politics 101? Like, I, I just cannot imagine having the kind of salary, the kind of means that the premier has, and he decides this is how his daughter's wedding is going to be paid for by by donations. It, it seems, is someone that is trying to be for the working person, the working man, the working woman. I mean, I mean, if my daughter was getting married, she's not, she's only 15, John. Um, but if she, you know, let's say 15 years from now, she decides she's going to get married. The last thing I'm doing is inviting people, asking them to pay $150 to be in my backyard because it's ludicrous to think yeah. about that for the working person, let alone the premier of this country. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, I think most people look at that and go, I mean, I, I can think of the stag and doe that our daughter and son and I had, which was uh, bring a bottle of wine. And if you want to kick in 20 bucks for the airplane tickets they are going to have for their honeymoon, you can, but you don't have to. Uh, you know, people have these events, but they're not, you know, they're, they're socials. They're about friends. They're about family. They're about people who are connected and love the couple. Uh, it's not an invitation that goes out to your list of um uh, contacts, and especially in government, when your contacts tend to be, stand to benefit from the decisions that you make financially. And as I said, you know, the premier has said, you know, that some people who benefited greatly in the tens of millions of dollars are her close personal friends. It's just too close. It's not right. There should be a separation. We've heard from the premier that he's just tired of being asked about this event. That doesn't stop you, though, right, John? No. Well, I just, you know, it, it provide, you know, the premier said, you know, he confirmed finally after a week and a half that the tickets were $150. Well, that's great. And then he said afterwards, well, I don't know. Like, I, don't, I can't tell you he was invited. The boys took care of that. Well, he's got four daughters. Well, just two of the boys. It's just like be open and transparent about it. Tell us who was invited, and uh, and and then you won't have to answer questions. But when you hold back information, you know it just like and it trickles out like oh yeah, this gets for one hundred and fifty dollars or you know it, it just people don't people are going to keep asking questions. I mean, I used to call it you know with, with my kids, 
and I hope they're not listening. It used to, <laughs> used to be the progressive truth, right? Right. I would eventually get to the truth after asking a whole bunch of questions. And, you know, um, and, and you get the whole story. Well, if the premier doesn't want to be asked questions, just be open and transparent. And there won't be any questions. And people can judge, you know, whether what you did was appropriate. And here, I, I think from a from a, a regular Ontarian, the perspective of, of somebody that's getting up every day, working their nine to five job, getting the kids to soccer, you know, working, at, worried about their taxes, figuring out what they're going to buy at Costco. I think the average Ontarian thinks, I want not only John Fraser, Doug Ford and Merritt Stiles to be dealing with the issues of this province, like health care, you know, like, like, you know, the infrastructure projects. Like, I want them to be dealing with the business of the day, not what happens in the premier's backyard. No, I, I yeah, no, we shouldn't. We, we shouldn't really be talking about it. And, you know, we the thing is, is there are a lot of challenges that are ahead of us right now. And one is affordability. You know, and and people are really struggling. So, what is the government going to do to make you know people's home heating uh, challenges uh, more affordable, especially those people who really can't afford it? Um, you know, grocery prices are going through the roof. Um, hydro prices didn't go down like the premier said they would. They went up. So we should be dealing with that. Our healthcare system. We got a you know a crisis in in human resources. If you don't have enough people to care for the people that need it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we need to be focused on that. Uh, and, you know, the government, you know, getting you know, has been focused on opening up the green belt. And they say building more houses and making houses more affordable. But all the actions that they've taken have really just um, created the opportunity for a few insiders to get an advantage and make tens of millions of dollars. While the everyday problems of costs with Ontario families, the government's well, they're not really focused on. Well, John, we look forward to, we're going to follow this story, obviously, sorry to interrupt you. We're going to follow this story really closely and, and have an opportunity to, to see where this, to see where this goes. And, uh, and I think it's definitely given, uh, stag and doze a bad name, John. Uh, yes, no, (laughs) no, I, yeah, yeah. They're supposed to be fun and family. Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, and sometimes for people who really are having a hard time with their wedding, to help him out. For sure. And it's usually not to have a big lavish affair. 100%. Right, so. John, thank you Thanks so much uh, for your time today. John Fraser, interim party leader of the Ontario Liberal Party and MPP for Ottawa South. We know it's a big weekend for the Liberals. Anxious to see what steps they take uh, to get to that new leader eventually. When we come back, Eric Elper is going to be here. We're going to talk to him about rock star problems. Who's afraid of flying? Well, we're going to find out. When we come back on City News. Sam LaPrade will be right back on City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Join me for season three of Paula Roy's Favorite Foods. Whew, that was a lot. I think I need a nap. It's a new season of the new Fly Fisher on Rogers TV. My husband is a wonderful man and a great father when he's not drinking. I'm so angry he chooses alcohol over us. If he really loved us, he'd stop drinking, right? My counselor suggested I try Al-Anon. I didn't understand why. I'm not the one with the problem, but I'm glad I went. Do you worry about someone's drinking? You are not alone. Al-Anon or Alateen can help. Call 866-200-0033 or visit alanon.org slash hope. I'm not special. Cancer happens to people all the time. I take one mile at a time. 26 miles a day. I want to set an example that'll never be forgotten. Sometimes, it feels endless. But the pain I feel is nothing. I've seen little kids in so much pain. Somewhere, the hurting must stop. 
Mary Fox ran more than halfway across Canada to raise money for cancer research. Every year, millions of people around the world continue the marathon of hope in his name. Hi there, this is Meg from Fit Over 50. In our next workout, we're gonna be using weights for a full body workout. You can expect both beginner and advanced options. See you then. Getting caught up with Eric Alper. Hi, Eric. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Eric Alper, of course, is a publicist and music commentator and talks about all things music. And I love what we're talking about today, Eric, and that is rock star phobias. And I, I just was like, I couldn't go down the list fast enough. Uh, so I saw that someone, well, many people, are very nervous about flying. Tell us who that is. Yeah, you know, this is a really good indication that sometimes rock stars are just like you and I. They have fears and worries just like us. And because of the kind of... You know, rock stars in the past, in the 50s and 60s, dying in plane crashes, and also just the regular just fear of heights. David Bowie had a massive fear of flying. David Lee Roth from Van Halen, Gene Simmons of Kiss, and also Brian Wilson had a fear of flying as well. And each of those artists kind of stopped touring for a certain period of time because of it. In the case of David Bowie, he didn't fly at all for five years and actually tr looped the globe while on tour, but he did it by boat, by bus, and by train while wow. performing in the U.S. and Japan. In the case of Brian Wilson, he was so terrified of flying that he just decided to stay at home while the rest of the Beach Boys went out on tour performing songs that he actually wrote and composed. Wow, that is a phobia. When it, when it really does stop your life, right? I mean, it, it, it's, uh, yeah, that's really, really interesting. I noticed uh, that somebody is very scared of spiders. Yes, and that person is me. Um, but it's, uh, <laughs> that person is also Freddie Mercury. Um, in his book called Mercury and Me, his former partner, Jim Hutton, revealed that Freddie was terrified of spiders. In fact, he would be screaming coming out of a room whenever he saw um, an eight-legged creature. Um, he said that he didn't like spiders, but he really meant no harm to them, and he would never ask ask Jim to kill one he just didn't like being in the same room as one I'm I'm with I'm yeah, with Freddie I'm with Mercury him too. yeah there you go yeah. you and I Frederick Mercury we all have uh, something in common yeah uh, it, yeah exactly you know because I, I don't think that being bit by one is going to turn either of you or I into spider girl or spider man and it's <laughs> no absolutely <laughs> the other uh, one that I thought was really interesting was uh, Alice Cooper tell us what he's yeah, scared Alice of Cooper has a big fear of needles, and this is kind of surprising considering that he's such a leader in shock rock. He has a guillotine on stage. He deals with snakes and bloods and, and just gore galore, but one of the nicest people in music. Um, but he has a big, big fear of flying. Um, but despite all of that, he actually got a COVID shot um, in 2021 and openly encouraged his fans to do the same. Um, there was a number of studies that turned out that it was actually somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 25 percent of people who didn't actually get a COVID shot weren't anti-vax. They were actually terrified of needles. And now you've got Alice Cooper in your good company. Oh, that's so interesting. And that's where that's where a rock star becomes real. 
right? Yeah. When, when Alice Cooper is like, oh, by the way, I'm scared of needles, but I'm going to get my COVID shot. Uh, it just, you know, seeing them up on stage, you just think, well, you know, you don't, you don't think about things like, uh, like, you know, their, their everyday life, if you will. Yeah, for sure. And especially because of somebody like Alice Cooper who deals with, um, you know, horror and, um, and blood and guts, but one of the nicest people in the world. And he just, he's just very theatrical about it, knowing that he's got a big fear of something just kind of makes him a little bit more human. Absolutely. And I, I'm, I'm not a big germ fan either. Uh, and either is Ringo Starr. Yeah, Ringo Starr's got a very good reason why he doesn't like germs, and it's a massive phobia. Um, when he was six years old, um, he had his appendix removed, and the complications of that operation um, left him with TB, and um, that kind of laid him up in a hospital until he was about 13 years old, and then he got it again. So he's a real germaphobe, um, and it still continues to this day. In fact, if you meet him, he will not shake hands, but he will rub elbows as a way of saying hello, just like Howie Mandel. Right. Um, they just will not kind of touch something that has been touched before. They're just so terrified of getting sick again. Interesting, interesting. And I don't know if you heard uh, about all the great concerts coming to Ottawa. Did you hear that Kiss is coming? Yeah, Kiss is coming for the final time, and yeah. this is it. I know that they've said it before that they've, you know, that that this is the final final tour, but this is absolutely is um, the last time that they're coming. Are you going to go? I'm I'm hoping to go. Absolutely, yeah. I would love to see them. And uh, I got my uh, tickets for the the Chicks. I'm very excited about that. Amazing, they're coming. That's, that's and, great. Uh, don't, don't get those dates mixed up because you don't want to go in costume <laughs> to go see the Chicks. You know, with full on makeup at the at the at the wrong. Show. That would be such a Sam LaPrade move. You have no <laughs> idea. You have no idea. And then, of course, Bruce Springsteen's coming. So I, I got to tell you, I'm heartbroken. I, you know, I went in, verified fan and all that kind of stuff, did not get the nod. So very heartbroken. Well, we can see about doing something about that. Let me let me call up a few people off here. Now, this is only for you. Please yeah. don't text <laughs> me. Please don't email me. Right. I'm only going to do this for one person. That's you. So oh, we, it'll be well worth going. It's, uh, it's very exciting. And I bought my ticket to see Stephen Page uh, in Clayton, New York. Oh, nice. I'm so excited. We That'll have... be great. He always puts on a good show because it's not only his solo stuff, but also Bare Naked Ladies uh, tunes as well. Exactly, exactly. He's got a great band. Uh, just love everything that we talk about, all things music. Uh, you've just given me over the years, Eric, just this different way of looking at music and I'm so grateful I love our time together oh, I'm happy to do it anytime Sam Eric Elper publicist and music commentator at that Eric Elper of course on Twitter and you have to follow him on Twitter he asks some really great questions and the answers are hysterical I, I don't answer all of them but certainly uh, I do uh, participate which is lots of fun a uh, very busy show for you today here on City News you want to stay with us for this short news break we'll be right back on the Sam LaPrade show on City News. Sam LaPrat will be right back on City News. 101.1 FM and 1310 AM. October 5th, 2014, my daughter was hit by a train. She was walking along the sides of the tracks and it shattered her world. <laughs> Hi everybody. My name is Brian Aslan, and I'm with The Commotions. We are performing Encore Ottawa 3 this week. Be sure to tune in. When an impaired driver killed my brother DJ, some people used the A word. They called it an accident, but it wasn't. An accident implies that no one was at fault. But when someone impaired by alcohol and or drugs chooses to drive, they're fully responsible for the crash that can result. So please, for the memory of my brother DJ and the thousands of families whose lives have been shattered by impaired drivers, let's drop the A word. A crash caused by impaired driving is not an accident. Hey folks, it's me, Giovanni Petiti, the host of the RTV Quiz Show, the hottest show on television. It's the hilarious quiz show where you, the viewers, play for valuable, non-existent prizes. It's got great trivia, fun facts, and a lot of laughs, all blended together in a perfect cocktail of edutainment. So join us Wednesdays at 7.30, right here on Rogers TV. Nice. 
Hi, I'm Justice. And I'm Nia. And we believe dreams fuel revolutions. That's why we're engaging with Canadian icons and the causes they support. Join us for these inspiring conversations and find out how you can be revolutionary. for Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News 101 Everywhere. It is Thursday, March 2nd. Good morning. I am Dami Lola Unime. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, light snow and zero. And here's what's making news this hour. A review has been launched by electoral officials to examine reports of foreign interference in the last elections. The move was revealed during testimony at a House of Commons committee investigating meddling by the Chinese government in the last couple of federal votes. In her opening statement to the committee, Carolyn Seymour, the Commissioner of Canada's election, says she's taken, she takes rather seriously the claims of foreign interference that have come into the public public light since November and she has launched a review to see whether any breaches of the Elections Act occurred. Provincial police reportedly have yet to uncover any evidence that would warrant an investigation into whether any Ford government officials tipped off developers before opening up parts of the Green Belt. The Trillium, an online publication focusing on Queen's Park issues, uh, has uh, obtained an email from an OPP detective which says in part, currently the OPP has no evidence to prove anyone in the provincial government acted in dishonest, partial, corrupt or oppressive manner. They add no one has has come forward with any proof. Premier Doc Ford and Housing Minister Steve Clark have repeatedly denied that developers were given a heads up about the plan. City News Time is 11.32. I am Damilola Unime. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. The Sam LaPrat Show continues on City News. 101.1 FM and 13.10 AM. Well, if you're like me, you'll have to check your calendar and say, hey, it's not Friday, it's Thursday, because we're speaking with Keith Whittier today, movie reviewer. How are you, Keith? I'm doing fantastic. How are you? Fantastic, too. Uh, you've Love been checking it. out uh, lots of great movies for us. Uh, I understand you went and saw Creed 3. Yes. Tell me a little bit about that. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't sure if we were playing a trailer. Okay. Um, sorry, so, Keith. Sorry, Keith. I didn't know we had the trailer up and running. These guys are so efficient. So here we go. Curious, what happened with you two? I didn't tell you. We was like brothers. I was the best, though. Man, I never got a chance to prove that. That's cute. Hey, hey, what you doing, man? Hey, 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 hey. I know what you're doing, Donnie. You don't owe this to nothing. Damien's fighting the world. He's trying to hurt people. I vouch for you. You think you mad? Try spending half your life in a cell. Why did somebody else live your life? I'm coming for everything. Well, that's kind of intense, Keith. Yeah, so this is the third Creed movie, but it's also a continuation of the Rocky series, so it's really like the ninth movie, I guess. Um, this movie stars Michael B. Jordan, and he has taken over uh, the, the, the franchise in the sense of the baton was passed from Sylvester Stallone to him several years ago when we got Creed, and he's at the point in his career uh, Adonis Creed, this is, where he's now more of a mentor. He's he's retired from boxing. He's 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 mentoring fighters at the gym. He's more of a promoter now. Then uh, somebody from his past, played by Jonathan Majors, comes onto the scene. Turns out the two of them were really good friends. Um, the the Jonathan Majors character went to prison for, for for many years, and now he wants to pursue a career in, in in boxing. But we realize that he's got much more evil plans for for, for Adonis Creed. Um, 
So this movie is also directed by Michael B. Jordan, and it's a pretty set franchise with 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 these with these Creed slash Rocky movies. He hasn't really reinvented anything, but I will say it's somewhat difficult to see actors many times go from acting to directing. But uh, Michael B. Jordan does a very good job of it. This is an this is an entertaining film. It isn't flawless by any means, but it's still worth a watch. Jonathan Majors, who I'm calling my 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 breakout star of the year, just because he's got three fantastic films on tap for 2023 we already saw um or i should say three fantastic performances we already saw him in ant-man and the wasp we have this one and then we've got which i think is the best of the three magazine dreams to come out later this year he is very very strong in this film so i i do recommend it again if you've seen if you've seen some of these rocky slash creed films it does follow the same type of pattern doesn't mean it's not enjoyable though and, and let me ask you, am I am I having to head to the theater or am I watching this at home? This one is actually a, a, in the theater. But again, like anything we've seen lately, wait a month or so and then you can watch it at right. home. So. In my yeah. coach, you know, my on my couch with the with the puppy lying on top of me and all that kind of exactly. stuff. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah. Fantastic. The next one we're talking about is Palm Trees and Power Lines. You know, I like any girl at all. Really? Yeah. Like you see me. Like I can really see you. I don't want to see you other guys. You understand? I'm not. Hey. So you haven't been answering any of my texts. You want to run away with me? Maybe. There you are. I haven't seen you in days. What have you been up to? We all know that you've been hanging out with the geriatric. Leah, the man is a pervert. Oh, good heavens. What is this about, Keith? Yeah. So this was actually my favorite film of 2022. It had its debut at the uh, Sundance Film Festival early January last year. It's now getting its release, and it's it's uh, nominated for multiple Independent Spirit Awards. This is a fantastic film. You've got in her debut role Lily McInerney, who plays Leah, and Leah is a, is very much a disconnected teenager. Feels like she doesn't fit in with her friends, disconnected with her mom, and she comes across this guy named Tom, who's two year sorry, who's twice her age. So she's like sixteen, seventeen. So he's like mid, uh, you know, mid late thirties. So they start hanging out together, and what starts off is just kind of like one of these bizarre like uh what made november i guess they call them relationships turns into something much more much more sinister um tom is played excuse me tom is played by jonathan tucker who i have to say one of these actors that is extremely underrated every performance that i've seen him in he's just brought it he's just been very strong and a lot of people remember him from the uh, from the show kingdom where he played an mma fighter and just completely um uh embraced that role and just became that 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 persona and very much in this in this role this is a very dark character that he takes on and and absolutely nails it it's directed by jamie dack who based this film loosely on her own experiences as a teenager and thinking about like some of the relationships that she had in her past um this is a movie that's going to be on um that you're going to be able to get on itunes as well as the the, the google play store i don't know if it's coming to prime video or netflix or what have you but i know it's going to be on those platforms it's it's not always an easy watch but it's a very strong film with with exceptional acting and i was very very impressed with it it's a bit of a gut punch when you see it but again, it's one of those movies that I, I couldn't recommend. I couldn't recommend more. If you're looking for something that that you're going to be talking about, I think Palm Trees and Power Lines is it. I think my biggest criticism of this is it's probably also one of the worst promoted films, in in the sense of not hearing a lot about it. In terms of critical review for it, it's been outstanding. But again, I think the I think they probably should have hired a different PR firm. So, but it's, uh, yeah, and it's so interesting because it's such a unique title, and I'm thinking to myself, I have never heard of this film, yeah. uh, ever. And yeah. uh, and this is why I love doing this with you, though, Keith. Is is you bring us those ones that might slip under the radar, right? Yeah, no, I appreciate fantastic. that. Fantastic. I have to tell you, I watched The Whale this weekend. Oh, excellent! Oh excellent. my heavens! Yeah. That 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 performance by Brendan Fraser again, I I I I was just absolutely captivated by it, and I think it just goes to show when an actor is given an opportunity to shine. Sometimes we see them and we think to himself to ourselves, oh, I guess he peaked at Encino Man. No, right. <laughs> he wasn't given he wasn't given the opportunities, and now it's good to see that he was he was given that.
Well, I'll get, and that's another example is the whale. I would have never, that wouldn't have crossed my radar. I mm-hmm. know it's gotten lots of obviously acc- acclaim, but you, you talked about it way before all of the, all of the acclaim. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's chat a little bit about last seen alive. 911, what's your emergency? Uh, yeah, I would like to report a missing person, my wife. I need the camera footage from surveillance. The camera's been busted a couple weeks. You said the camera's not working. That's live. What's going on here? I got no video here, okay? Yeah. Hey. Hey. Okay, thank you. What is going on here? Who's that man? Have you ever had an affair? No, I haven't had an affair. Is your wife? Well, this sounds all too familiar, unfortunately. Yeah. So we, we've got Gerard Butler, who is basically doing everything he can to remind us that he's an action star, because all of his movies lately just seem to be in that, uh, in that genre, which right. I'm, I'm totally fine with. Uh, in this movie, him and um, uh, the, his wife, played by Jamie Alexander, are going through a bit of a, bit of a rough time, and he, they're actually on, they're driving, and they're on their way to her parents to drop her off because they're doing a bit of a separation. They get to a truck stop. She goes in. He's uh, to to the gas station. He stays out to pump gas. Next thing you know, she's gone missing. The fact that they're having marital problems makes him a suspect in her disappearance. But he's like, no, I had nothing to do with it. And then he goes on this this um, this track to, to to track down his wife. This ha- this is very reminiscent from a film that came out years ago called The Vanishing, an exceptional movie with Jeff Bridges, Kiefer Sutherland, and Sandra Bullock. Even though it kind of starts off the same way as that film, it then veers off into a, into a completely different direction. I think The Vanishing is a classic. I think uh, Last Scene Alive is a, is, a, is a decent film. It's on Prime Video. Um, it's interesting as, as the audience going on this journey to understand, okay, is Gerard Butler's character like a bad guy or is he completely misunderstood? What happened to the wife? So I like these mysteries where you're looking at all the clues as an audience and trying to understand as, as things unfold. So I do recommend this film. But again, if you've got the time, I'd also say, you know, check out The Vanishing, which I think is probably one of the one of the best thrillers. So, I mean, it's a movie that came out years ago that, but that, that'll just stay with you. And I don't but think I've is, seen that movie. I haven't seen the yeah. Vanishing. Okay. Yeah, it's, 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 it's absolutely riveting. And it's what, for me, scary movies, and we always talk about horrors and what have you. To me, the scary films are the ones that are more realistic to happen. Right. So things you could actually see happening in one's life. Mm-hmm. But um, Last Scene Alive, I think, is a, is, a, is a good movie. I wouldn't say it's great, but if, you're, if you've got the, the Prime Video subscription and you're looking for, for, for something to watch, not a bad alternative. Okay. And our yeah. final uh, film today is To Leslie. What do you plan to do with 190,000 smackaroos? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe buy a house, buy some knife for my boy, you know? Just have a better life. Save my soul. She's blew all that money. Yeah. 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 Where's she been? I won the lottery. I was the one who won the lottery. Look out for yourself. I always do. Oh, I want to see this, Keith. Yeah. So, Two Leslie got a, a surprise Academy Award nomination with its lead, Andrea Riseborough, being nominated for Best Lead Actress. And it was interesting because... Kate Blanchett at one of the award ceremonies like shouted her out in her acceptance speech and says, hey, we need to pay more attention to other roles like this. Um, and then there was this whole controversy about her being nominated. All of that aside, as the, uh, as the clip that you just played alludes to, we've got this character, Leslie, who wins the lottery, should be on top of the world, but then kind of blows it all. And then, you know, tail between her legs comes back to, to, to her small town and has to deal with the repercussions of that. Uh, Riseboro, for her credit, is a, is a great actor, um, very much under the radar in that. I don't think that she's a household name, although when you go through her resume, she's delivered a lot of fantastic performances. So her Academy Award nomination isn't out of the realm of possibility, and it's definitely justified. Um, Two Leslie's a very good movie. Again, what, one that wasn't really talked about, I think, until the nomination came along, but there's some really great performances, not just from not just from Riseboro herself, but Allison Janney's got a strong performance in this um, as, as well as uh, uh, from a supporting standpoint. I think it's definitely worth a watch and I believe it's Mayfair that's, that, that has it on this weekend okay. and it's always nice to show some love to the Mayfair Theatre so sure. if you're looking to, to go through your Oscar checklist, you have an opportunity of two Leslie in theatres this weekend. And I have to say, you mentioned Allison Janney. 
I really, as I look back on it, I realize I've been a fan for a long time, but I've just sort of went, oh, yeah, I loved her in that, and I loved her in that. She just, she's in so much. Mm-hmm. It's hard to sort of you know, keep track of her, but at the same time, she, she's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, the other thing too, consistent. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter what sort of performance she's in, whether it's comedy, whether it's drama, she always brings it. And it's true. There's so many, there's so many people that are under the radar. I think like a Stanley Tucci comes to mind. So you think to yourself, yes. I've seen him in, ev- in all these different things and he's always good. So absolutely. absolutely. I was asking Noah a little bit earlier if he watched the watcher. Have you watched the watcher? Um, if I if I'm remembering correctly, is that the the movie with the couple that move in and there's yes. a guy across the the the, the, the other building keeping yeah. an eye on them? It's a series on on Netflix and uh, and I'm just I'm I'm just loving it. So I'm sharing with everybody uh, to watch The Watcher. So yeah. okay, there you go. Very good. I'll, I'll, Look at me I'll giving you ideas. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Keith, I always appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. You enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Keith Whittier is a movie reviewer. We really lean on Keith here on City News to tell us what to watch. And there's the odd week he says, hey, I watched this. Don't bother. It wasn't great. Uh, so we love that too. I appreciate uh, everything that he does for our show here at City News. When we come back, Dr. Doris Grinspun is going to be here. She's the CEO of the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario. We're going to be talking about health care nurses in this province. Stay with us on City News. Sam LaPrat will be right back on City News. 101.1 FM and 1310 AM. Next time on Simply Cooking by Chef. With the cost of food constantly on the rise, we can't afford to let good food go to waste. I'll show you how to whip up a tasty and healthy meal with on sale and discounted items, which will save you a few bucks as well. Your City News forecast for today could be a windfall of cash. With our weather guarantee, if we're off by 3 degrees, you could win. Enter at ottawa.citynews.ca. And if you hear your name on Wake Up With Rob Snow at 7.21 a.m., call in to claim your cash. On Thursday's Daytime Ottawa, the Vanier Museo Park will be joining us on the show because their Sugar Festival is back. You may recall that their Sugar Shack burnt down. Well, it has been rebuilt and they are so excited to have it back. Also, Little Ray's Wildlife Rescue has a couple of traveling exhibits they're really excited about. So I'm guessing we'll probably get some pretty cool creatures in the daytime studio. All that and more on Thursday's Daytime. The regulars, the guys who keep this place in business. Last week, they had something to celebrate. Jason had just finished university. So they toasted his profs, his TAs, his old roommates. Well, they toasted just about everyone. But I worry about and take care of my guys. So even when I know they're not driving, sometimes that means bringing them a little surprise. And then they had a drink to me. Brought to you by SmartServe Ontario and Arrive Alive, Drive Sober. I'm Julian Armour from Music and Beyond. Join us for a new show this spring on Rogers called Music and Beyond Presents. Play four games of bingo from the comfort of your own home each Monday at 7 p.m. for your chance to win money from our $2,000 regular bingo or $5,000 super bingo night. Kiwanis TV Bingo, Mondays at 7 p.m. on Rogers TV. Twenty bucks. Twenty bucks. We're on the line for twenty bucks. The Sam 
Pamela Pratt Show continues on City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. And here we are on City News. We wanted to get caught up with Dr. Doris Grinspun today. She's the CEO of the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, and she's at Queen's Park today. Hello, doctor. Hi, how are you, Sam? Good. It's great to hear your voice, uh, Doris. And uh, and I know you're you're at Queen's Park for a very specific reason today. What are you hoping to accomplish today? Well, uh, first of all, uh, we had uh, meetings with a huge number of MPPs, about 60 or 70 of them. Individual members from all across the province met with them for uh, pushing the agendas of uh, um, expanded scope of practice for RNC. As you have heard, that's about RN prescribing. Uh, that needs to move for the sake of Ontarians so they have access. The nurse practitioner-led clinics, uh, the issue of compensation that remains to be the key challenge for retaining nurses in Ontario, the issue of uh, safe workloads so that they can provide the care that they need to provide, they want to provide both to attain um, professional satisfaction, more importantly, to ensure Ontarians get the care they need, and a healthy work environment and nurse practitioner-led clinics. So we will see at 2 p.m. the minister is coming to speak. Both Minister Calandra and Minister Jones are coming to speak with our members. Hopefully they will have some good announcements. Um, some of these issues have been waiting on the sidelines for way too long. Some and the public cannot wait, nor can nurses. Um, Doris, do you still have hope uh, that Bill 124 will be repealed or, or have you just moved on? No, we never will move on because the reality is that Ontarians cannot have us move on simply because we have less and less on uh, nurses. We came to this pandemic with a shortfall of 22,000 RNs. Now we have a shortfall of 24,000 RNs. Meanwhile, uh, nursing continues to be uh, a career of choice for many. As you know, the applications to nursing schools have go have gone up exponentially. We released a report some today called Nurse, Nursing Career Pathways, Opportunities and Barriers. Obviously, it continues to be an inspiring profession that people want to join and want to stay. The government needs to make sure, though, that they create the conditions so everything in investment means nurses are staying in Ontario and not going elsewhere because that's really the issue. And uh, compensation is a key factor. And Bill 124 is what has made us move to a deepening and deepening crisis. That bill, that cap compensation at 1%, is really at the core of why nursing is in the crisis that it is today. And Dr. Grinspun, I noticed uh, a lot of nurses that were were protesting in different areas and, and really trying to get this message to the government. There was one particular uh, placard or, or, or uh, sort of sign that really stood out to me and it sort of, um, uh, you know, really kind of sort of hit me in terms of, of what nurses are dealing with. And the placard said you know, uh, punched a police officer, got arrested, punched a paramedic, got arrested, punched a nurse, and management asks, what could you do differently next time? And, Absolutely. And I that not, shocked me, Doris. It is shocked. It is shocking, and that's exactly what we mean by healthy work environments. Uh, that That is critical and we spoke about that during the press conference today when we issued the report nursing career pathways the respect what you just express is how professions quite frankly that are male dominated um, are more respected than uh, the nursing profession the same goes the same goes some for the issue of iron prescribing uh, look at pharmacies they started to ask for that about 18 months ago they already got it we by the way support pharmacies with iron prescribing you know we have been asking since 212 
2-12, then, uh, then Kathleen Wynne announced that it will happen. Eric Hoskins, who was Minister of Health under the Liberals, announced that it was happening. They sent it to the college. The College of Nurses Regulatory Body approved it in 2019. Still, it's not happening. So we absolutely need the minister today to come clean. Minister Jones to tell simply, yes, our Empress driving will be implemented now in the next couple of months here in Ontario because it has been approved by the regulatory body. And yes, we will create healthy work environments that no nurses cannot, uh, cannot just uh, um, uh, put up with violence, which is what you describe. No, it's not nurses that need to do something different. It's society and governments and employers need to start to respect nurses the way that the patients do. Mm -hmm. And we know that uh, the Premier and, and the Prime Minister had an announcement and, and talked about, you know, what's what's happening in terms of health care for this province. Do you still have the ear of Premier Ford? Do you think uh, that he's actually hearing you, Doris? Well, we will see this afternoon. You know, I am, uh, for me, uh, relationships are good to have. Uh, having a good relationship with any premier, which I do, and past premiers too, and with ministers, it's wonderful, but it's more than a relationship. It's the deliverables, what is counting, and we expect at 2 p.m. to hear good news, and if not, we, you and I can talk again. Whether it is about the good news, which I would be thrilled to share, or it is about the rhetoric continues. If you were a, if you were a betting woman, uh, Dr. Grinspun, uh, is this is this good news today at two? I hope so. I hope that today they will announce that the REN prescribing will be implemented in Ontario. I hope that they will announce that the nurse practitioner scopes will free up to give to people what they need. That nurse practitioner led clinics, which we have discussed with government, will happen. Um, I, I absolutely hope, and let's see what happens. Look forward to it, uh, Doris. We're going to be following it very closely here on City News. We've been following this story with you for years in terms of, of Bill 124 and, and all the issues that you outlined today. I'm, I'm sending you positive vibes, Dr. Grinspun. Thank you very much. And Bill 124, um, whether they want to say it exists or it doesn't exist, what we need to see is that they increase competitive compensation that they ensure competitive compensation because if not we will go from 22,000 to the 24 now that we went and we will go to worse 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 and that's not good for Ontarians. Well it's a job I have a lot of respect for and uh, and I'm so grateful for all of our nurses in Ontario. Dr. Doris Grinspun joining us today CEO of the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario. We're going to be watching very closely to see what happens at two o'clock today and we'll bring you any of that breaking news as we hear it here on City News. We are getting ready for lunch. Are you getting ready for lunch? We're going to be feasting on some of those top stories of the day today. We're going to be talking a little bit about potential interference uh, by China in our federal election. We're also going to be talking a little bit about Black History Month and International Women's Day. Uh, Richard Sharp's going to be here. Laura Peck's going to join us. And we hope you join us on City News. Sam LaPrade will be right back. Hello, I'm Jim Deeks, host of Canada Files. I hope you'll join me each week for interesting and informative discussions with some of Canada's most impressive people. Hi, my name's Ange. I'm from the Angelina Hunter Trio. We will be performing this week as part of Encore Ottawa 3, and we really hope that you enjoy our set. When an impaired driver killed my brother DJ, my life changed forever. During the pandemic, all of our lives changed and many of us turned to alcohol and drugs to cope. As life returns to normal, the increase in substance use from COVID has lingered and some police services report an increase in impaired driving that caused heartbreak and devastation. Now, more than ever, we need your commitment to never drive impaired and to encourage all of your family and friends to do the same. Together, we can save lives. Do you have something to share? 
Let everyone know about your next meeting, your need for volunteers, or your fundraising event on the Rogers TV Community Billboard. Send us your words and we'll bring them to life on Rogers TV and RogersTV.com. When it's time to spread the word, go to RogersTV.com to add your announcement to the Community Billboard. Every year, dozens of Canadians are killed or seriously injured because they take risks around railway tracks. Talk to your loved ones about rail safety. Visit StopTrackTragedies.ca. Join me for season three of Paula Roy's Favorite Foods. Whew, that was a lot. I think I need a nap. CW 1310 AM in Ottawa and CJET 1011 FM in Smith Falls and the Valley. Number one for local news, traffic, and weather for Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News 1011 everywhere. Thursday, March 2nd. Good afternoon. I am Damilola Onime. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, a light snow, zero. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. An Ottawa man is facing a dozen charges in relation to the Orleans explosion last month. City News reporter Chris Curry with the details. It happened on February 13th, that massive explosion that rocked the East End. 12 of 13 families still displaced, and we now have an arrest. Police say they've arrested 35-year-old Cody Troy Crosby and charged him with four counts of criminal negligence causing bodily harm, arson causing bodily harm, and disregard for human life and property damage. A pair of break and entering charges as well. Crosby is known to police with a rap sheet that stretches back years. A statement from Minto says they're relieved an arrest has been made. Their thoughts are with the families and those injured, and they look forward to residents moving into their new homes in the development area as soon as possible. The investigation into the explosion will continue. Chris Curry, City News. With the weather forecast for Ottawa and the Valley, here is City News weather specialist Denise Andreacci. A bit unsettled at times throughout the early part of the afternoon. Highs near plus two today. We are clearing out overnight and we have quite a bit of sunshine through the day tomorrow before the snow starts to move in. So another high impact snowfall expected for Ottawa and Smiths Falls for Friday night, overnight and through early Saturday. We'll also see some blowing and drifting snow. Highs today near plus two. City News time is 12.01. The 2023 Tamarack Ottawa Race Weekend is about three months away. But the time has come for you to sign up for any of the races scheduled for the weekend of May 27th and 28th. Ian Fraser is the race director for Ottawa Race Weekend. We are, are tracking to be above where we were in 2019, which was our last um, pre-pandemic in-person event. And we've been absolutely um, thrilled at uh, how registration has been going so far. Uh, we put uh, uh, about 30,000 participants in in 2019, and we're tracking just a little bit above that this year. There will be Olympic athletes and racing champions from around the country and the world competing in the one or more in one or more of the race events, which includes a marathon, a half marathon, a 10K, 5K, 2K, and even a marathon for kids. To register, head to runottawa.ca. We know during a House of Commons committee hearing into foreign interference in our elections, we're learning Canada's election watchdog is probing complaints. City News Parliament here reporter Cormac McSweeney has more. The first to testify today were electoral officials and the Commissioner of Canada Elections, Caroline Simard, confirmed that she's aware of the public reports about meddling attempts from the Chinese government in our votes and has launched a review to see whether there was any potential breaches of the Canada Elections Act. Canada's chief electoral officer says on the specific allegations that are out there in the public, CSIS, our spy agency, has never passed that information on to his office. The stories first hit headlines due to leaked reports from CSIS detailing intelligence about how China has 
has tried to meddle in our vote. The head of CSIS, David Vignon, has not been asked yet about whether he passed on that information to electoral officials or why not, and uh, says he can't discuss the leaks of classified info. However, he does have a strong warning about foreign interference. Foreign state actors who engage in these deceptive, covert and hostile activities seek to weaken trust in our fundamental institution and processes, threaten communities, sow division and ultimately influence policy. Meanwhile, opposition parties are also calling for a public inquiry. Cormac McSwinney, Parliament Hill. I am Damilola Unime. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Connecting you and your community. This is the Sam LaPrat Show on City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Thank you so much for joining us here on City News. It's lunchtime. We always invite a couple of people to lunch every day, and I love the combination we have today. Laura Peck, senior partner at Transform Leaders, joins me. Hi, Laura. Hi. And you're having lunch today with Richard Sharp, director of Black Equity Branch, Center for People, Culture, and Talent, the Treasury Board Secretariat of Ontario. Hi, Richard. Good afternoon. It's uh, it's a day we have certainly lots to talk about. Uh, we know that there is uh, certainly um, you know a very big topic today in terms of uh, potential interference by China into our federal election. Are we taking this seriously enough, Laura? Um, nice to meet you, Richard, over the radio. And uh, Sam, thanks for your question. Um, I think that uh, the Prime Minister is taking it seriously. Uh, he doesn't want another inquiry, but I just listened to your newscast, and there's no question that uh, there are a lot of concerns, that's for sure. Um, but it would bring into question the legitimacy of some of those liberal MPs who accepted money and volunteers and who might have benefited, and I, and I say allegedly might have uh, benefited. So, uh, so far the Prime Minister will uh, continue to, to not want to have an inquiry. And even yesterday in a press conference when he was there to make a health care announcement, all of the questions from the media were about Chinese influence. So he's going to try to not get too involved. It's uh, it's very, very interesting times for sure. Uh, Richard, what are your thoughts? Are, are Canadians and, and our government taking this uh, seriously enough? I think the Canadian government is, is think, taking this seriously enough. I, I, I can't really speak on behalf of the Canadian government, of course, but um, my, my sense is that they're assessing risk. Um, they're assessing, you know, any impacts to the, to the country, and they're receiving advice from um, bureaucrats within the federal institutions that are responsible for things like national security and other things like that. I, 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 I really do think that um, they're doing the best that they, they can within a, a very uh, fast, fast moving and, and fast changing uh, global environment. Um, but I, uh, my, my sense from you know my my a, a distant vantage point is that they're they're doing um, the best that, that that they can at this particular point in time. Are you worried, Laura, about uh, you know basically our our political stability at all? Do you feel like you know we're we're heading down uh, a track that uh, that we couldn't come off of? Well, uh, the three Ds would be don't dodge, duck, and don't deny. That really doesn't work. Uh, in earlier days, Richard Fadden spoke of some of these concerns about election uh, interference, the two Michaels, those kinds of issues have been discussed for some time. Um, and it's clear that Canadians are worried and concerned about the reach of China into our democratic institutions, our technology, uh, rumors about where did the uh, where did COVID start? We we have to be concerned about those kinds of things that that maybe have originated from Wuhan. Canadians want answers, and uh, they want for their anxiety to be uh, brought down by the by the facts of the day. 
So, you know, it, it, these are legitimate concerns that people have. And we're just, you know, we're in such a, a challenging time. I mean, we, we obviously COVID, the, the war raging in, in Ukraine, a lot of political stability around the world. Richard, I think it does make Canadians a bit uneasy and, and, and really, I'm hoping, even come in tighter and, and protect the democracy that we've built in this country. Oh, yeah, well, well absolutely. We'll protect and, and, and strengthen uh, democracy and, and civil liberties and, and rights within this country you know, should be foundational to, to, uh, to any country. I think before we talk about going to other places where you know, we, we'd like to uh, ensure that they're treating people right, we got to make sure that we're doing the same thing here in, in, in our country, in our munition states. So I see that there are efforts uh, to do that. Uh, both from the government and both by civil society organizations to try to improve conditions here. Uh, but absolutely, uh, I think we, many Canadians, see ourselves reflected in the lived experiences of others from other countries. We're, many of us are descendants from people from, from other countries, so it definitely does have emotional and, and, and other impacts on us when we see people in crisis in other parts of the world. So. But, Absolutely. Uh, definitely. Yeah. To do that, uh, we gotta get our house in order first. A hundred percent. And we know that that part of this story, in terms of of China, uh, from this week, is is really the TikTok story. Uh, Laura, we know that uh, the government, as of February twenty eighth, took TikTok off of all government issued uh, phones, which kind of begs the question: Why would TikTok be on federal? phones but but maybe that's just me maybe i'm maybe i'm in the dark ages uh but it, it's certainly all all tied in in terms of of privacy and and really protecting canadians from what i understand yes and the federal government wants to be seen to be doing something actionable so by banning employees from using tiktok on their government issued devices uh, that is one thing if people want to partake in the popularity of TikTok on their own time on their own personal devices they can still do so it's just that uh, on on government um, uh, devices which could or might have sensitive documents data that kind of thing uh, no you you they cannot partake on that and um, y- you know Canadians um, may not all realize that uh, it's a rule in China that all companies must provide and give up all data to the government if they ask for it so if you're partake, uh, it, it's owned by TikTok is owned by a Chinese company. So you have to be aware, and some people might be, you know, fine with that, no problem. But if it's a, you know, most people within the government, within the federal government, are dealing with our personal data. So we do not want to have that in the hands of other people. So that's why they took action. Do you think it's an overreaction, Richard, or? Uh, or is it a long time coming? I, I think it's uh, it's a reasonable reaction, all things considered. Like I, I've worked in government for more than twenty seven years now. I can't see why any any government worker would want to have TikTok on their work phone. But my my work phone wouldn't have games, wouldn't have anything, wouldn't have anything. Not only TikTok, but I wouldn't have other apps on my phones that uh, data mine and provide my information back to servers that are not. Uh, strictly government. So I, 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 I kind of, you know, if there's a policy that's looking at TikTok, I personally, I look at all sort of third party apps that are not provided by government right. um, 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 officials and so on, because, <laughs> you know, it really doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense for us to, unless we're, you know, personalities and we need. You know, TikTok to do our work if they're doing it, using it for communications. I, I guess I can see that in some cases, but the vast majority of us use 
airplanes for just regular work. Well, because I think, Richard, it, it does put... I think it puts the person in a precarious situation as well. Like, I, I wouldn't want to, if I worked for the government, I wouldn't want to have anything. I'm, I'm like you. I, would, I wouldn't have anything else. If I had something, maybe I have another device and I have my, my Facebook or, you know, my Wordle or whatever on that phone. Uh, but mm-hmm. a work phone is, is for work business in, in my mind. Yes, yes. I, I, even on my personal phone, I don't have any of these things on my phone. I think that they're, they're too intrusive. You talk, you talk in a room and your phone is there, and then all of a sudden, ads start flying up on your computer. It's like, yeah. uh, you know, there's, there's a level of um, in privacy and a level of data information sharing that I think uh, we should all sort of be aware of. And, and I think that in this case, governments, and not just the federal government, but other levels of government are taking precautions to make sure that um, employees are safe and also, you know, government information that are housed on these phones are safe. So it can make, it makes, it makes some degree of sense. Lots to talk about with Richard Sharp today and Laura Peck on Lunch with Sam here on City News. We're going to come back after this short break. We're going to talk about Black History Month and International Women's Day. Uh, lots of other subjects on uh, on the menu today. Stay with us here on City News. Sam LaPrade will be right back on City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's a new season of the new Fly Fisher on Rogers TV. Hi there, this is Meg from Fit Over 50. In our next workout, we're gonna be using weights for a full body workout. You can expect both beginner and advanced options. See you then. I wanted was to see a movie. One down, please. I can't sell downstairs tickets to you people. How dare they? I could afford to buy the more expensive ticket. I run my own business. (laughs) But they refuse to take my money. They left me there all night. On what charge? They said I didn't pay the theater tax, but it was really about color. Sister Desmond, appeal this conviction and your community will stand behind you. Do you have any idea what this will do to us? So what are you going to do? Make it right. Viola Desmond's case inspired Nova Scotia's civil rights movement. She was pardoned 63 years later based on the injustice of her conviction. October 5th, 2014, my daughter was hit by a train. She was walking along the sides of the tracks and it shattered her world. City News. It is lunchtime and we're talking about those big news stories of the day with Richard Sharp, Director of Black Equity Branch, People 
Centre for People, Culture and Talent, the Treasury Board Secretariat of Ontario. And Laura Peck is here as well, Senior Partner at Transform Leaders. Richard, let me ask you this. Do you think initiatives such as Black History Month and coming up on, on March the 8th is International Women's Day, do you think these things, whether it be Black History Month impacting anti-racism movement or uh, in terms of International Women's Day impacting gender issues, do you think these initiatives actually impact? Well, I, I think that they have uh, certainly an initial uh, impact in terms of getting people to start having conversations at, at, at a point in time, right? Like, uh, I, 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 black history is, is Canadian history, and, and, and I don't relegate it to the, the shortest and the coldest month of the, of the year. Um, uh, and same for International Women's Day. I think we, we celebrate the women in our lives, and we should, 365 days of the year. All of us come from a mom, right? And so, um, but I do think it starts a conversation. I think uh, we have to be careful that people don't, you know, uh, create these affinity kind of, uh, you know, uh, days and, and months, and then forget about the issues for the, the other 11 months or the other 364 days of the year. So if it's the start of a conversation where we're talking about justice and rights and anti-racism and, and dealing with sexism and misogyny in our in our society and in our organizations, then, then that's great. But not, uh, you know, March 1st, I don't stop being black. <laughs> you know, and so it's, uh, I think it's important that we uh, keep these things going all year round. 100% exactly my my sort of uh, take on it as well in terms of you know and, and the pride community says this all the time it's great to have uh, you know pride month or the pride parade or pride week um, but unless you're going to sort of take on and, and learn during that time and use it the other days of the year then then they you know the initiative isn't what it's meant to do the the objective is to to actually educate and, and change minds. How do you feel, uh, Laura, about this subject? Oh, th these uh, events definitely raise awareness. Um, back in the day, I, I did my education degree in Halifax, and I learned so much. Um, and certainly the impact of International Women's Day um, has been great. I, I think it's great to for for women and and for for the for the partners that we have both in the workplace and in our personal lives to sort of recognize that uh, we my goodness we move mountains <laughs> and uh, so I think that these are great uh, events to celebrate and um, I think anything that raises awareness uh, gives us an opportunity to have a, a conversation I think it's all good. I agree. And a conversation is really where it starts. Uh, Richard, I noticed last week uh, a local school, it was All Saints School. In terms of Black History Month, they, they studied the story of, of uh, Mr. Till. And then what they did is they did projects around it. And then they walked to the movie theater and watched the movie Till uh, as part of, of sort of their their education for Black History Month. I love that layered approach of taking Black too. History Month and, and really making mm -hmm. it so much more, Richard. I think I, I really applaud All Saints School for doing that. I wish that was all the schools here in Ottawa. Richard, what do you think? Oh, yes. I, I think that uh, schools taking that kind of approach to, to, to Black History or Canadian History, as I like to call it, I think it's really, really good. But not just in February, as I was saying, you know, we, we could celebrate Emancipation Day on, on, on August 1st, which is the day that uh, enslavement was banned in Commonwealth countries. There are so many other days and, and, and other things that we could celebrate. But for sure, um, you know, and not only looking at our history in terms of history of struggle and history of sort of enslavement in Canada and the U.S. and other parts of the world, but we can also look at you know, our history of, as the builders of civilizations, right? Um, the builders of, of languages and, and our contributions to the world that predate uh, the enslavement uh, of black people by Europeans. So I, I think it, it's great when we, we're starting to take steps down that path, looking at history and using that history to help chart a better future, a future where we're not 
treated like second class citizens in the countries of our birth. Right. Absolutely. So I, I think it's great. I, I do think those approaches are great. I, I, I look forward to more progress in the terms of learning of our, of our children of, of all racial backgrounds so that they have a better perception of black people in this country. A hundred percent. And and as we turn our, our sights as well to International Women's Day happening on, on March the 8th, we're doing a special show here on City News on March the 8th to recognize International Women's Day. Um, I'm having the opportunity to participate in a number of events that day as well. Laura, how are you uh, recognizing that day? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm a third generation career woman. So I'm going to call my mother. <laughs> because Yeah, yeah. No, seriously, my grandmothers uh, were both teachers. Uh, they were educated, had a lot of kids, um, and highly, highly influential in my life, that's for sure. And my mother, whom I talk to very often, I'll give her a special call, because I was amazed at, at what it meant to her. It really did. It really... Um, yeah, it meant a lot to my mother when uh, we started to to make it an official day. So there you go. Uh, it means it means not just something to our generation, but to our mother's generation, and hopefully to our daughters also. So I think it's a good thing. Richard, is there a special uh, woman in your life that uh, really influenced you? Oh, my mom. She, she basically single-handedly, I think, raised six of us in this country and gave us some really amazing skills with her grade eight education, uh, communication skills, how to be with people, how to understand when we're in a dangerous place. Like she was, uh, she still is amazing where we are her retirement, we are her pension as her children and so we take care of her. So I, I think, um, we, I guess we are all calling her not just on March 8th, but we, we call her up pretty much every other day. Uh, but certainly, you know, I, I put her up on a on a on a pedestal in terms of she made us the six of us, and uh, we are successful. You know, my father he did his part as best as he could, but she really was a rock. And uh, yeah, yeah, I, that's, that's, I think that's that's who I would put up first in, in terms of the women uh, that have most impacted me in my life. Well, aren't we lucky to have, uh, I feel the same way about my mom. She's, uh, she's my rock for sure. And, uh, uh, but all three of us to have, to have moms that, you know, really uh, have been influential in our lives. That uh, not everyone can say that, right? I mean, there's a lot of uh, people that come from, from homes that, uh, that don't have that kind of support. I'm glad to hear all three of us do today. We're going to end today on a little bit of a, a fun note, Laura. Is that good with you? Yes. Okay. Today is Dr. Seuss Day. Today, if you can believe it, March the second. Uh, what's your favorite Dr. Seuss book? Oh, the places you'll go. It's very inspirational. It's uh, something that uh, we read to our kids, and um, you know, now we have a more evolved social conscience. And there are certain books that the um, that the foundation has uh, they they stop publishing them. But uh, there are so many Dr. Seuss bl- books that are fun, but the most inspirational is, oh, the places you'll go. Absolutely. How about you, Richard? Oh, it would have to be green eggs and ham. <laughs> ham, I am. I love it. Uh, yeah. I used to read it that way. I used to read it with that voice to my all of my children, and they yeah. loved it. Um, and I think I loved it more than they did, actually. <laughs> yeah. Get into character. Oh, that's yeah. so much fun. I took my daughter on a cruise, uh, and it was all Dr. Seuss themed, and they actually did serve us uh, green eggs and ham. So there you go. Uh, oh, uh, oh, lots wow. of uh, lots of fun. And the other thing I'll say about Dr. Seuss is the, uh, you know, Oh, the Places You'll Go book. When my daughter started school in, uh, in kindergarten, I sent her that book uh, at the end of the year uh, for her teachers to write a little something in it. And we've kept their tradition up. And, and she even took it uh, uh, just last semester. She's in grade 10 now. And, you know, she has the teachers write a little something in it. And she just treasures that that book so much. So I give that idea to, to grandparents and parents out there, there in terms of, of how to use that book. Uh, it's been uh, such a pleasure to spend time with you both today. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon. You too. Richard Sharp, Director, Black Equity Branch, Centre for People, Culture, Talent, Treasury Board, Secretariat of Ontario. Laura Peck, Senior Partner at Transform Leaders. What a great lunch that was today. We're getting ready for the business lunch, the OBJ Business Lunch. Stay with us here on City News. Sam LaPrade will be right back on City News. 101.1 FM and 1310 AM. Hi everybody, my name is Brian Aslan and I'm with The Commotions. We are performing Encore Ottawa 3 this week. Be sure to tune in. I'm Justice. And I'm Nia. And we believe dreams fuel revolutions. That's why we're engaging with Canadian icons and the causes they support. Join us for these inspiring conversations and find out how you can be revolutionary. Everybody knows not to drink and drive, but some people still think it's okay to take drugs and drive. Police have the authority, the ability, and the tools to determine if drivers are impaired by legal or illegal drugs. And because drug-impaired drivers can pose just as great a risk as drunk drivers, they face the same penalties, like the loss of their driver's license, a criminal record, fines, and more. A message from the RCMP, the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police, and Arrive Alive Drive Sober. Once upon a time in a nursery rhyme, there were three bears. One, two, three bears. And they went a walking in the cool woods a talking while their porridge began. Rogers TV invites you to let your imagination roam as we present Ottawa Storytellers. Each week we'll present a collection of original creative stories and inspirations for children of all ages. Join us for Ottawa Storytellers on Rogers TV. The cost of food constantly on the rise, we can't afford to let good food go to waste. I'll show you how to whip up a tasty and healthy meal with on sale and discounted items, which will save you a few bucks as well. Number one for local news, traffic and weather for Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News 1011, everywhere. It is Thursday, March 7th. Right now in Ottawa, in Smith Falls, light snow, zero, and here's what's making news this hour. We're learning electoral officials are now investigating claims of foreign interference in the last vote. As the House of Commons Committee continues its investigation of meddling by the Chinese government in our last two elections. In her opening statement to the committee, Caroline Seymour, the Commissioner of Canada's elections, says she takes very seriously the claims of foreign interference that have come into the public light since November. And she has now launched a review to see whether any breaches of the election act occurred. Ottawa police have laid charges against a 35-year-old man uh, for the Orleans explosion. Cody Troy Crosby is facing 12 charges, including arson and criminal negligence. The arson unit investigated the February 13th explosion that brought four homes under construction to the ground and damaged over 30 others in their area. And one other person in Russell County facing charges following an animal cruelty investigation. Officers from the uh, Russell County Detachment of the OPP responded to an animal complaint in Clarence Rockland on February 23rd. During their investigation, officers learned that a dog had sustained serious injuries. 35-year-old Francis Privus is charged with cruelty to animals, unnecessary pain, suffering or injury. And he's due in court on March 22nd. City News time is 12.31. I am Damilola Unime. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. The Business Lunch on City News, brought to you by the Ottawa Business Journal. The Sam LaPrade Show continues on City News. 101.1 FM and 13.10 AM.
Well, we talk about all things business here on the Business Lunch, brought to you by OBJ. We're so happy to have them. We're always looking in the OBJ for all sorts of different articles and, and interesting people uh, to meet through the OBJ. Hope you uh, check it out as well. We wanted to uh, get caught up today with John Hepburn, CEO of the nonprofit National Innovation Organization, Midix. Hi, John. Hi there. This uh, topic of student internships is certainly top of mind for me. I have a daughter who's 15. These things I'm starting to think about, so is she. Uh, We understand there's lots of these internships up for grabs in Ontario. Uh, talk, uh, Talk to us a little bit about how we can get involved. Well, let's first of all talk about the intern interns and internships themselves. These are um, collaborative research projects uh, between university researchers and industry partners. Um, And of course, it's driven by student interns. So the interns are the means of transferring all the great knowledge we have at universities and colleges into uh, the industry sector. So the students divide their time between industry and university. And yes, we've got a lot of them uh, going on uh, across Canada. Um, We've been in the business for 20 years of of doing these collaborative uh, projects. And we expect this year and next year to deliver about 21,000 of those across Canada. And we're currently zeroing in on uh, between six and 7,000 in Ontario for this fiscal year. We, you know, run on a government-like fiscal year. So So same number next year. Yeah, so it sounds like this is a a great matchmaking opportunity. That's really what you're in the business of, right? Absolutely, yeah. What we do is uh, we have business development professionals, coast to coast, loads in Ontario, three dozen in Ontario or more. And they basically work uh, between the universities and businesses to to really find the talent that business needs to to advance the innovation agenda and hopefully uh, bring increased jobs and prosperity to Ontario. That's what we're in the business of doing. And so who are you looking to sort of hear from? Are you looking for uh, for businesses to reach out or are you just looking for the actual interns themselves? Everybody. What we do is the, the business development people are, you know, they're busy out there on the road meeting uh, both at universities and in industry. But we also on our website have sometimes industry will identify a problem and you know we know that there's talent somewhere that can solve it but we haven't yet lined it up and so we have a a place on our web page uh, which is uh, you know m-i-t-a-c-s you know my tax is not an accounting firm as you said quite rightly at the at the, at the outset um we have a place on the website uh, mytax.ca where students can check in and say hey that looks like something I'd be really interested in doing. Uh, it becomes part of their academic program. I mean, really, our goal is to cement uh, university and industry together. So, as I say, great knowledge at the universities uh, works to the benefit of, of industry and society. Well, it sounds fantastic. And the benefits, of course, is is the incredible experience that that these students would would come out with and and I look back on even my career 152 years ago Richard or um, John when I used to do sort of you know this type of work and it would be uh, really I, I don't I don't think I would be where I am today without uh, those types of opportunities oh sure and I think that it's look I was a professor for three decades before my current gig and so, you know, I trained a lot of students, and I hope I was very good at training them in how to do research and, you know, how to understand technical things. But, you know, I was not a business person. And so the students benefit um, at the university from all the great technical and research knowledge. And the work in industry uh, basically acquaints them with the way things get done in industry and provides them with uh, professional skills. You know, how do you how do you make a pitch? How do you talk to people? How do you work in a team? How do you stick to a deadline? Mm-hmm. So those sorts of things are the skills that students acquire and plus they get connection with industry and they get jobs. And, and it's so important and something as simple as even uh, having communications on the phone. Th- this generation doesn't speak on the phone like maybe our generation did, uh, John, you know, in terms of, of just reaching out to people and, and whether it be a cold call or a warm call or whatever that is, uh, even even soft skills like that, you know, that uh, that just aren't uh, being taught in school. Absolutely. And, and we've, you know, we've done a study on what skills are needed for the modern economy. And it is those sorts of skills, um, really professional skills, things that are beyond their 
technical training that they get at colleges and universities. And, and those skills are pretty important when you get out into industry, when you leave the academic world, which, you know, virtually all graduating students do. They go and they work outside the university, uh, in industry, in government, uh, with social organizations. Well, it's fantastic. Uh, how can people uh, reach out to John? What's the process uh, if someone's listening? You've inspired them today. What do you want them to do? What they should do is, uh, I've already referred to our website, uh, mytax, M-I-T-A-C-S dot C-A. They can also, through the website, they can find, I mean, in Ottawa, we have many. We work with all the institutions in Ottawa region. We, we will do more than a 1,000 internships just in the Ottawa area this year. They can find also the, who the business development professionals are. Um, sometimes they're actually, they work uh, co-funded by the universities uh, in Ottawa or they're just in on the Ottawa region. So they can either contact a business development professional uh, who works for us or they can look uh, at uh, opportunities that are available on the website. So the website's a good place to start. And I and they should talk to people at their university or college, you know, their, their supervising professors and ask about MyTax. MyTax is the place to go. CEO John Hepburn, thanks so much for joining us here on The Business Lunch on City News. Well, thanks so much for your interest. Absolutely. I've been uh, checking out the OBJ, so I get it every single day uh, on my on my phone, and uh, I've been checking out lots of different uh, articles. One that sort of caught my eye the other day uh, is that there's going to be a new Ford distribution center uh, set to open in Castleman this spring. So this is really good news. And of course, that's the Ford uh, dealership. Uh, the uh, the center is uh, supposed to be opening in the spring of 2023, which is very good news. This is a hundred million dollar facility. It's being developed by the Burton Development Corp of uh, out of Quebec. Um, uh, and it's, it's really interesting to sort of see the job creation that's going to be in that area. It's going to be, and I know you know where this is, 417, close to the interchange with St. Albert Road. You know what I'm talking about. You know right, right where I'm meaning. That warehouse uh, is expected to uh, service so many different people. It, this is a 562,000 square foot uh, facility uh, and will be helping 154 dealerships in eastern Canada and the Maritimes. You can't tell me there's not business happening in this region. There's a lot of really, really good stuff happening in this region. So if you're out in that area, uh, you might notice uh, this new uh, distribution center for Ford uh, opening up in your community. Maybe it's going to create a bit of job creation out there as well, which is always, always good news. Uh, You're listening to the uh, Business Lunch by the Ottawa Business Journal here on City News. Stay with us. Sam LaPrade will be right back on City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Your City News forecast for today could be a windfall of cash. With our weather guarantee, if we're off by three degrees, you could win. Enter at ottawa.citynews.ca. And if you hear your name on Wake Up with Rob Snow at 721 AM, call in to claim your cash. Play four games of bingo from the comfort of your own home each Monday at 7 p.m. for your chance to win money from our $2,000 regular bingo or $5,000 super bingo night. Kiwanis TV Bingo, Mondays at 7 p.m. on Rogers TV. On Thursday's Daytime Ottawa, the Vanier Museo Park will be joining us on the show because their Sugar Festival is back. You may recall that their Sugar Shack burnt down. Well, it has been rebuilt and they are so excited to have it back. Also, Little Ray's Wildlife Rescue has a couple of traveling exhibits they're really excited about. So I'm guessing we'll probably get some pretty cool creatures in the daytime studio. All that and more on Thursday's Daytime. I'm Wendell Clark with a word about winning. We all know it takes a team effort in any sport and with any challenge. You can be a part of the winning team that shuts out impaired driving. Whether you're out on the town or just hanging out with friends, drink responsibly. Always have a plan for a safe ride home for yourself, your family, and your friends. You'll be helping to shut out impaired driving. Visit ArrivaLive.org to find out more. Arrive Alive. Drive sober. Uh, 
on back in, okay? It's a new season of the new Fly Fisher on Rogers TV. Hello, I'm Jim Deeks, host of Canada Files. I hope you'll join me each week for interesting and informative discussions with some of Canada's most impressive people. Thank you so much for joining us here on City News. This is the Business Lunch. We have the opportunity to talk about all things business. We saw some news yesterday that I was quite shocked about, and that is the Byword Market BIA being dissolved. I mean, that's been an organization uh, that I've had numerous conversations with over the years, uh, and I think there's a new executive director there now, but for many, many years, I worked with uh, Yasna Jennings on on many, many initiatives, especially when I was with the Ottawa Mission uh, during my time there. So uh, dissolving this uh, particular um, BIA was really, really interesting to me. We really rely on those BIAs, and I know, of course, the businesses do as well, to, to be that advocate advocacy group. I know a lot of them help with marketing and do all of those uh, different uh, issues. So we want to talk about the BIA today. Uh, we're just getting uh, City Councillor Stephanie Plant on the line to have a conversation about that today. Of course, Stephanie represents Ward 12, which is Rideau Vanier. I don't know if you listened earlier this week, I had a gentleman on, David Mangano, who owns uh, the Grand Pizzeria, and he is in the Byword market, and he was talking about uh, a, a customer that was going restaurant to restaurant and dining and dashing, you know, getting uh, bills up to $150 and just walking out saying, I don't care. And and, uh, and so that was really disappointing because we know the people, of course, uh, that have been uh, so incredibly impacted by COVID-19 or so many of those businesses in the byword market. Uh, we wanted to speak with City Councillor Stephanie Pallant today, and she is on the line. Hello, Councillor. Hello, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to spend time with you today. The news about the BIA in the byword market being dissolved came as a bit of a shock to me. I mean, I'm, I'm not involved in a day-to-day -day basis down there, but I would have thought that BIA in the byword market was an important uh, association, an important group for the businesses. Tell us, tell us what's happened, Stephanie. Yeah, so this was um, this all happened obviously prior to my election in uh, November. Um, so what they're doing is they're dissolving, but they're becoming a market uh, corporate, like a municipal corporation. And what a municipal corporation can do, we have tons of municipal corporations here in the city of Ottawa. So if you think of like Ottawa Community Housing, or you know Toronto has its own market district, is they will now be able to sort of set their own parameters for certain things that a municipality normally takes care of. So for example, if there's a World Cup final at the other end of the world and it starts at 9 a.m., under normal circumstances, a bar in the Byward Market would have to lobby weeks in advance to the city to open at a particular time to be able to sell alcohol. Well, now they will manage those requests sort of in-house and, you know, for something like the market, which is a bit special, it has a lot of restaurants, it has retail, it has the, one of the biggest malls in Canada. They do kind of need to govern themselves according to what their needs are. Um, you know, there's sometimes in Canada Day, they have to have special rules around that or St. Patrick's Day. 
And it's just a new chapter for the Byward market. And I'll be really honest with you, the feedback that I'm getting from retail, from restaurant owners is really, really positive. Everyone is really excited. Okay, that's great. That's fantastic. I I, I guess from my perspective is, is the fact that they would still have you know some advocacy and and some marketing help and and all right. of that because you know as as we were saying just as you were coming on the line uh, we were talking about a very specific case about uh, unfortunately a, a customer that was going restaurant to restaurant and dining and dashing bro oh, that's and terrible that's, i used to be a server that's terrible that it, is the worst that comes out of a server's like like their their tips at the end of the night. Well, and what's horrible about it is that we spoke with David Mangano, who was who was lovely. He's the owner of the Grand Pizzeria. It right. happened to his yep. place and a number of different places. But what he was saying is they actually have a fund for when this happens, and that broke my heart because right. Right. that money comes to your point. That money comes from somewhere, and yep. and that just that absolutely breaks my heart. So my point is, you know, for situations where you know the the byword market has just been through so much to right. have that kind of advocacy and and that process i would hate that that went away no of course and i think what they can better articulate which i don't think is necessarily something a bia does as effectively as a, as a municipal corporation is we will be able to see sort of through the taxes they contribute how many people work there what is the effect of the local student population you know we'll be ever better able to see sort of the effect of the byword market on the economy of the city. Now, we know they contribute. I think they're the second largest tax base in the city after the federal government. I have to, I don't know if that's with the Rideau Center or without, I'd have to check that, but they are one of the biggest tax contributors in the city. And, you know, if they feel like they want to sort of have their own structure and do rules that can better apply to a more entertainment historic district, you know, I think it's a great idea. The 200th anniversary of the Byron Market is coming up, and we definitely want to do a big splash for that, and I'm looking forward to working with them. And it's it's really interesting, because in some of the sort of correspondence I've seen on this, they were sort of referencing the Byward Market and comparing it to the distillery district in Toronto. Right. And I love it there, just like I love our yeah. Byward Market. Um, yeah. And and so it really becomes uh, that destination place. And, and, and to your point, it sounds like there's going to be more flexibility especially going into the 200 anniversary uh yeah. so so that sounds like all good news for business yeah and and you know you have to understand too there are families who live in the byword market as well and have for generations and so we just want to make sure that the byword market is a welcoming place for everyone no matter what your income no matter what your status if you're a tourist if you're a family if you're elderly um and i'm just really looking forward to working with them on that you know we have some really awesome plans for how we're going to animate it in the summer we're looking at a lot of pedestrianization um you know and, and with the with the chapters gone we're thinking of putting a new a, like a covered farmer's market in there so lots of exciting things on the horizon and i'm just so lucky I get to have a front seat to it all. So Okay, so I didn't know that the chapters had gone. When did that happen? Well, they didn't go. They just moved inside the other the other side of the Rio Center. So oh, now they're the they have one door and it's an it's called indigo. All of the chapters are, are going to an an indigo structure. Right. So if you want to go to chapters, you just have to cross the street now. The indigo is across the street. And so one of the discussions I've been having and what people really want to see, kind of like Jean Talon in Montreal, right. we have like this winterized covered market and you know we could do like a christmas market we could do something that sort of has air conditioning in the summer because the summers are getting a bit spicy right so right. lots of really good opportunities and uh like i said the overall everybody seems really really positive about it like uh i don't know about you but waiting six weeks for a permit to have to open a little couple hours earlier to me seems a bit right. insane so 100%. them being able to sort of manage special events whether it is Blues Fest, whether it is a, a World Cup, whether it is Winter Lude, I, I, I'm totally on board with them being able to promote the events that make the Byron Market so special. A hundred percent, Stephanie. Thank you for that. We know that this was your first uh, seat at the table for this budget process. What right. was the process like for you? Was it what you thought it was going to be? Well, I brought snacks because <laughs> I knew it would be a long Smart. day. I had, I had like a whole bag of snacks. Um, oh, that's funny. Yeah, it was exactly sort of as I, as you would expect sort of any kind of government deliberation. You know, a lot of people advocating for their little square of the city. A lot of people had some really special projects that they wanted to push forward. You know, Riley Brockington and the free transit for 12 and under, which passed. Um, the mayor was really adamant about the percentage of tax increases. Um, you know, a lot of really interesting projects across the board. And 
I was a bit, you know, it was my first time. So, I, you know, I only sort of spoke to some of the piecemeal issues that affect my word. I, you know, for example, when they talk about the agricultural and rural affairs, I didn't have much to say about that. Because, nice. <laughs> you know, it doesn't really affect my word. So, um, you know, I always love, I mean this very sincerely, I always love hearing what's happening in other words because I do spend a lot of time in mine and I have the best word in the city but I'm really biased um but I really do love hearing other people what they're doing I really do love having my council seat at the table and I'm so happy it was passed unanimously like what a what a nice sort of gift for Mayor Sutcliffe to have in his first like 100 days in office is this unanimously passed budget I overall everybody I think was really really pleased and I you know I had snacks left over at the end so well, I was there good. you go yeah that's important yeah. for sure <laughs> we spoke with Mayor Mark Sutcliffe a little bit earlier today and and asked him about the process and and he echoed exactly what you said you know to have uh it, it be unanimous was was wonderful and and just to see everybody sort of rowing in the same way but but also asking the tough questions right I mean it's not about it's not about uh you know just just sort of blindly passing something there were some some great uh, deliberations there one of the comments that uh, we're hearing a lot here on City News when we do our our lunch with Sam. We have community members in. Is this is this sense that City Hall is is kind of boring again? It's it's calm. There's you know there's nothing there's nothing no scandals going on. And and I and I mentioned that to the mayor and I thought I hope he realizes I think this is a positive thing. Um, but I think it is positive, Stephanie. Would you agree? Absolutely. Like the biggest sort of scandal I had was, I'm, I'm not sure if you heard my office and another council's office flooded and now we're sharing sort of a shared space. And I was like, listen, whose paper is in the printer? Like, is it yours? Is <laughs> it my so budget? Funny. Like, you know, like these are really like the, the sort of issues we're tackling sort of at the, at the council or counselor uh, level. And that to me seems the, the level of appropriateness for, um, you know, what a council should have to deal with. But um, I would agree, and, and I just want to say too, like I just personally had a mission to go visit every councillor in their ward after I was elected. I'm almost done. I believe I have two councillors left, but everybody is really collegial. Everybody really wants the best. We don't always necessarily agree on the same things, but mm-hmm. you know, there's nothing that's sort of said personally or um, to, like you know to be mean or vindictive. Like everybody really wants, you know, we really want the city to thrive, and that's going to take everyone to kind of get on board with some key pieces, whether that's LRT, whether that's opioids. You know, we do have some very serious big city challenges and it's up to us to rise to the occasion. Are you nervous when you see reports about about uh, high vacancy rates for A, B and C type uh, uh, properties uh, in the downtown core? Does it make you nervous, Stephanie? that I actually thought my ward had one of the lowest vacancy rates because we have so many students and they tend to kind of fill up those uh, those apartments very quickly. So sorry, I, I was I referring. Hear, sorry, I'll just interrupt. Sorry, and I and I okay. didn't phrase that very well. So my apologies to you. I was referring okay. to uh, to more of the commercial property. Oh 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 yes. Oh my God! If I had a magic wand and a million bucks and a money tree, I would shake that and turn that all into housing. Absolutely, but. Um, one of the pieces we passed, a motion that uh, my, my, my sort of neighbor colleague, Ariel Trotter, passed a couple weeks ago was exactly looking at where the vacancy rate is and trying to see if we can convert those to housing, even if it's, you know, retail on the floor and then housing on the top, like every other city in the world does it. There's no reason why we can't do it here. Um, and yeah, absolutely. It's, it's something that we, we need to kind of put all the options on the table for housing, even if it's like, oh, we have housing on Spark Street. Like we always had housing on Spark Street. Why would we not have housing on Spark Street? You know, it just makes sense that we would kind of return to uh, former ways of housing because that's how people have always lived. It's actually quite new that people only sort of just commuted into downtown and then went back into the suburbs. So I think it's a great idea that we we look at all options and, you know, I'm sure you've seen there's still, even with the return to work, some government buildings, especially in my ward, that have emptied out entirely. So, you know, we got to go just go knocking on the feds and seeing what those price tags are. I'm sure they're not cheap. I'm sure the conversions are not cheap, but, you know, we're in a housing crisis and everybody kind of has to get on board with the fact that we need to put give people keys in their hands and a roof over their head and that will make a huge huge dent in the housing crisis we're seeing right now 
Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us today. Counselor Stephanie Plant from Ward 12, Rito Vanier. Uh, she's a little bit biased. She says it's the best ward in the city. Uh, we appreciate her time today. Lots of guests joined us today, including Mayor Mark Sutcliffe. We kicked off with him today. We spoke with interim Liberal leader John Fraser today uh, and had a great uh, lunch discussion today with Richard Sharp and Laura Peck. Uh, we really uh, appreciate everybody uh, spending time with us here on City News. We're getting ready to be back with you tomorrow. We're working hard on the show for tomorrow, but for this afternoon, we want you to lock it in. We expect some news out of Queen's Park today regarding nursing. Our news team is on it. Lock it in to City News. You've been listening to The Sam LaPrade Show. Tune in again for local news and community views on City News. 101.1 FM and 1310 AM.